yes, yes. For you, you need to speak okay. as close to this as possible, Professor. I will leave you with this yeah, already. Okay, very good. Thank and you very much. And the microphone, as you yeah, know yeah, how I, to I, handle it. I usually yes. hold it like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's coming for the uh, the panel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All set? Okay, excellent. Sure, it's reserved, so yeah, please. So, does this work? Okay. While uh, everybody's finding their seats, uh, we're starting off uh, rather punctual today, actually, for Brussels. Um, and I would like to uh, um, wish you all, dear distinguished speakers, panelists, and audience, it's a true pleasure in the capacity of being president of the European Energy Research Alliance to open this important conference today. One we have missed for over two years now by obvious reasons, hampering these kind of important dialogues to take place in the heart of Europe in Brussels. The title of our conference this year is The Clean Energy Transition from Vision to Reality. To give some backdrop, yesterday ERA had its 42nd EXCO meeting, albeit being one-third digital I could feel the enthusiasm bubbling through the surface, meeting each other, discussions taking place, of course digressions also, but that's part of the complex process of smithing new ideas. And that is very much needed. The climate and biodiversity crisis have not been in lockdown. And that is, <clears throat> and contrary to popular belief, the COVID-19 crisis only made a small dent in the emission trajectories. And the economic upturn has not entirely grasped the opportunity to build back better and to invest in green solutions into the recovery. In essence, we need similar but lasting effects as we had on the COVID dent in the emission trajectory every year to 2030. The energy crisis is upon us, causing social unrest and finger pointing to scapegoats. The energy transition and renewables are prime targets for that. But imagine an energy system with baseload provided by renewables, another low zero net 
uh, removal solutions with a robust backbone of interconnectors and flexibility. That is a truly robust system where the price volatil volatility of fossil fuels will have much less impact than what we see today. It will go unnoticed. So we need to build back better and keep the one and a half degree alive. A slogan for the COP26, which will kick off in less than two weeks from now. And what better time is there than for ERA, representing 250 RTOs and universities within energy research, to launch its white paper, Clean Energy Transition. It falls into the category of reports released in the preparations to the Glasgow conference. Being a European research alliance, our imperative is kind of natural in the European ecosystem, but uh, the overall narrative works for the planet as such. Key messages uh, and synergies and working together from a holistic point of view is part of this report. It falls within the thinking of mission innovation, and missions in itself and partnerships as pioneered by the Commission. And it provides a blueprint for how to tackle the issue at hand in an integrated manner. We will hear more about that later on today from our Sec General, but I'm really proud that we released this report today. So what does ERA 2.0 mean? It is the title of my intervention. Well, take the report I just mentioned. That is part of ERA 2.0, an alliance that wants to mobilize and engage towards the grand challenges of our time, drawing upon tens of thousands of energy researchers in Europe. Yes, it's true. That's actually the size of our following. And we are in for busy times. Browsing through the latest landmark reports, like the IPCC on the IVD6, um, the UNFCCC report on the NDCs and the stated policies, the IA, notably the Net Zero Emission 2050 and the World Energy Outlook just released, the IPBS, the UN Nature Panel and the Joint Workshop report from between the IPCC and the IPBS. It is clear that a concerted effort is indeed needed. We cannot feel defeated by these numbers and the evidence of progress, which is contrary to what we would like to see. We can only pursue our mission to catalyze energy research towards a climate neutral society by 2050. Not only pursue, but strengthen our commitment to this. As of now, ERA is strengthening its impact by pursuing three strategic strands. And they are all built upon our joint programs, which is the muscle of ERA. We have 18 of those in number, which in essence cover all the aspects of energy transition, from advanced materials uh, to specific technologies like PV and fuel cells and hydrogen, to social aspects and digitalization in energy. Green and digital are the buzzwords to be used here. We will strengthen our impact by a, to be a trusted advisor and provide thought leadership, integrating, integrating the vast knowledge in our alliance. We will establish a think tank type of activity with focal points, and focal points being people in this uh, context, which oversee the integrated complexity of the energy system, including the dimensions of nature conservation and land use, economic and social issues. This is now being progressed as we speak. Furthermore, ERA has the strength to mobilize member states and associated countries' investment in energy research and innovation concurrent with the EU vehicles for promoting energy research and innovation. I think I've not mentioned the European Green Deal yet in my speech, but looking at the, well, the Horizon 2020 European Green Deal call, we see clearly how our partnership is contributing to these efforts. The bulk of the projects which are being uh, funded here utilizes members in our alliance. 
But what is the next step in building a greater impact towards the very welcome and stated targets of climate and uh, Fit for 55? Mobilizing member states and associated countries' efforts by catalyzing actions for building what we call European centers of excellence in energy research. We are taking steps to prepare our joint programs for this challenge. We have been spending significant resources in characterizing such centers and how we can blend national funding with European funding. And to use clusters and center arrangements towards a European approach. What a value proposition this is for Europe. We are ready to step up to the challenge in an inclusive way and process, fully transparent and in open competition, of course. And would this not be a perfect match for the upcoming Clean Energy Transition Partnership? The idea is hereby served. Last but not last, last but not least, we see that international cooperation at a different scale is needed uh, than we have at, at present. The IEA NZE 2050 estimates that at the level of cooperation we have today, we will only reach net zero around the turn of this century rather than mid uh, turn, the, rather than, than the mid of this century. Cooperation in this context, of course, means a lot. Um, climate financing, damage and loss mechanisms, Article 6 arrangements or the Paris Agreement, but also knowledge exchange and social innovation in the technological narrative. We are pondering about this. How can ERA contribute to this cooperation? Of course, it's outside Europe. I mean, within Europe, we are a vehicle of cooperation in ourselves. Could the ERA clone itself into developing regions, neighboring regions to Europe? What about Mission Innovation 2.0? Surely, we cannot help ourselves from contributing there through our members and activities, uh, helping the member states and, and associated countries action, but can we support this even more? Could we engage in providing thought leadership through our think tank activities? Could we engage more in the shaping of programs to underpin the, those missions? That was actually one of the topics uh, discussed yesterday in the uh, Exco meeting of ERA, where we also had valuable insight into the mission innovation activities by one of our distinguished speakers today, uh, Director in DG Research Innovation, Rosalinda van der Vlies, which we will hear more about later today. So, I need to come to a stop. ERA is delivering on the energy transition and will continue to do so relentlessly. We can even accelerate. We are preparing ourselves for acceleration. We are not downbeaten by the numbers and scenarios unfolding, knowing that without us, there would be no chance of reaching the well-founded targets and en on energy and climate. Solving difficult problems, that's actually in our DNA. One famous statesman once said, if you're going through hell, keep walking. That is the attitude we need. And we pursue this in our shaping of the ERA 2.0, keeping the one and a half degree alive. And that concludes my introductory speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's now my pleasure to introduce the, the first speaker after the introductory speech. Um, which is uh, Jean-Pascal van Ypercelle. I hope that was uh, reasonably well uh, pronounced. <laughs> um, he is a, a full professor uh, in climatology at the, uh, and, and environmental sciences at the University of uh, Leuven. And he was also elected vice chair of the IPCC, uh, which you know, uh, in 2008, and also chair of the Energy and Climate Working Group of the Belgian Federal Council for Sustainable Development. So I'm really looking forward to an intervention. The floor is yours, John Pascal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, 
Uh, I'm very um, honored and pleased to be here uh, with you uh, this morning and also with uh, those who are looking uh, at this, who are watching this uh, online. Uh, being a climate scientist and not an energy uh, scientist, I will uh, speak about what comes upstream you work and some of the reasons to um, go as quickly as possible to, uh, towards uh, clean energy. Um, my talk might be too long, in which, way, uh, in which case I will uh, cut it short um, at the end. Uh, but um, I want to give you the broad picture right now, in case I have to um, uh, cut it short, in 10 words. The, word, the 10 words are not mine. I don't agree with every detail. I will correct uh, as I speak. It's real. Global warming is happening. I think there's no uh, dispute anymore about that. Um, it's clear now for everyone that indeed uh, climate is changing. Second two words, second couple of words, it's us. Human activity is the main cause um, and experts agree. Um, there's a very wide scientific consensus uh, about that, uh, broadly helped by IPCC. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, about the fact that since the middle of the 20th century at least uh, the, the warming and the associated changes are human caused and are due to the burning of fossil fuel and also to deforestation. Second, uh, following couple of words, it's bad. The impacts are serious and we are starting to see them not only on people but also on ecosystems. Um, and uh, in, in our country, uh, Belgium, we have seen uh, in July uh, the uh, terrible impacts of floods uh, in uh, the eastern part of Belgium, but we, also see, we have also seen in the southern part of Europe um, terrible impacts of forest fires and heat waves, etc. And uh, also, I must say, floods in, in Germany, not only in Belgium. Uh, but the last two words are probably the most important. Uh, there is hope. And there is hope not only because we have the technology needed, that's what's written here, but also because uh, more broadly uh, we have the, uh, the scientific knowledge, I mean it's broader than the uh, technology I think, needed at least to avoid uh, the worst climate impact. Of course we have gained 1.1 uh, degrees C already, it's on my tie, I mean it's becoming, this is the temperature of the last 100 years at global scale. We have gained 1.1 degrees C already since the pre-industrial era. Uh, we cannot um, reverse that easily but we can still still avoid uh, going above uh, 1.5 degrees C if we really uh, want it. So let's uh, start by giving uh, another element of context which I think is important uh, when we discuss climate um, issues and that is that there is a huge um, effort uh, ongoing to sow doubt uh, about uh, the, the, um, the, the fact that we need to address climate change. This is a peer-reviewed article, okay, Brühl, uh, 2014, in Climatic Change. And he looked in a very detailed way at the uh, budget the fossil fuel uh, lobbies in the US uh, have used uh, during that um, uh, time period. And it's almost a billion dollars per year to sow disinformation about climate change, but also about uh, the uh, alternatives, including uh, clean energies, of course, because they have shifted uh, their focus from uh, sowing doubt about the existence of global warming, it doesn't work very well anymore, towards uh, sowing doubt uh, about uh, the um, alternatives. So it's in that context that a little more than 30 years ago the IPCC was created not to do uh, additional research on climate change actually, but to assess uh, the uh, state of knowledge on the basis of scientific literature in the most objective and rigorous manner, in the most inclusive manner, um, uh, to, in order to provide uh, policy makers and uh, decision makers and actually every, citizens of, of the, every citizen of the planet with the uh, most objective source of information, not only about the causes of climate change, the process uh, that are at work, etc., but also about the solutions uh, that uh, are are at hand either to adapt to the part of climate change we cannot avoid anymore or to prevent by reducing emission of greenhouse gases. 
What we are doing, actually, with those uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, particularly CO2, is actually increasing, and I will very soon ask if we can turn the light down in this room uh, for 30 seconds. So this is my uh, request already, um, if possible. We are thickening a thermal insulation layer that we are installing around the planet. And I th really want to instill this idea in, in, your, in your head because uh, if we understand that what we are doing with our greenhouse gas emissions, particularly CO2, is increasing a thermal insulation layer, then we understand also, without any complicated uh, climate model, why we need to cut emissions which are contributing to that increasing thickness of the uh, thermal insulation layer to net zero as soon as possible. So this is, um, uh, is, is it possible to switch the, uh, the lights down for, for this slide? Um, as I asked 15 minutes ago, so there was time to prepare for that, uh, because then you will see better. On the left, you, you see the um, uh, increasing since 1850 concentration uh, of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, uh, you have the months of the year around the, uh, the circle here. And I like this presentation uh, because it, it suggests visually that increase in the thickness of that thermal insulation layer. And on the right, uh, you see over the, the same time scale, the increase in temperature um, of the global average temperature. And you see we have gained a little more than one degree C already. We're not very far from the red line here, which is hard to see, uh, but uh, which is a 1.5 degree C limit. And we're not much further from the two degree C uh, limit. So uh, another way to look at this CO2 concentration evolution is this diagram showing the evolution of the uh, concentration, which is measured in, spart in parts per million in the atmosphere, its proportion in the atmosphere, over the last 10,000 years. So this is the entire period during which civilizations were built, agriculture was um, set up, etc., etc., infrastructure, cities, etc. And you see that for most of that time, except the last 200 years, where there was an exponential growth, uh, the, the CO2 concentration has been stable. So the insulation layer was of the same thickness, basically. So, as I mentioned, this changing composition of the atmosphere is mostly due uh, to the uh, burning of fossil fuels, uh, the production of cement, so it's two or three percent of the emissions, and also to deforestation between 10 and 15 percent of CO2 emissions. The science about this is now crystal clear. Why is the CO2 concentration increasing? Well, for a very simple reason. The CO2 uh, concentration can be compared to the level of uh, water in a bathtub, and you know that level is going to increase as long as the input is larger than the output. And that's exactly what's happening. What we are emitting now, 40 billion tons uh, CO2 per year, is approximately two times larger than what the ecosystems and the ocean can absorb. So uh, it's an accumulation problem we are facing. And as mentioned uh, in the uh, opening speech, uh, the effects uh, of uh, COVID and the lockdown, etc., was almost negligible. Uh, because of uh, the mechanism I just explained. Because we are emitting two times more presently than what natural systems can absorb, a small, by a few percent, decrease for one year or two of emissions, even if they are at global scale, has only a negligible effect, as you can see, on the increase in concentration because it's concentration that matter. The concentration are related to that uh, thickness I was mentioning uh, earlier. So let's look at the uh, latest um, IPCC report published on uh, 9th of the 9th of August uh, this year. It's um, coming from the first working group of the IPCC, the working group dealing with the climate science aspect uh, of the problem. Uh, the other contributions, the three other contributions will be published in the coming 
coming year. Uh, the uh, Working Group on Impacts and Adaptation will publish its report in uh, February. You'll hear again about IPCC then. And then the third Working Group, which might be the one of most interest for you, uh, dealing with mitigation, how to reduce uh, emissions, will be published in March. And then the Synthesis Report will be published uh, in September next year. So it's a very solid report, just this contribution is based on 14, the assessment of 14,000 scientific publications. Uh, it was subject to almost 80,000 comments from all over the world. Uh, so it's a very uh, solid scientific uh, document. What are, what are its key messages? The first one is that human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in at least the last, tons, the last 2,000 years. The last 2,000 years is the period shown here. You see the natural fluctuations over that time period with a slight cooling after uh, the year 1,000, but you see the, the, the shock uh, we have um, succeeded to produce uh, in global temperature with uh, our uh, influence on climate over the last uh, 200 years. Why are we so convinced uh, the warming is coming from uh, the uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases? The, the observed warming is the black curve here. And most of the conviction about the, the, the solidity of the link between CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions and the warming come, not all, but most uh, of that conviction come from the comparison of those two curves. The uh, greenish uh, curve here and the yellowish curve there. The greenish curve is showing the result of um, simu climate simulations made with the best climate models, which are forced only by natural um, forcing factors, solar activity changes and volcanic eruptions. Uh, and as you can see, those factors only produce um, uh, climate fluctuations, which on average are quite horizontal. While when you force the same climate model with natural factors, the same, and human factors, uh, mostly greenhouse gas uh, emissions, you have something that is uh, matching much uh, better the observed um, uh, temperature. And this is why over time, since the first assessment report of the IPCC, as you can see, we don't have the time to read together everything, but up to the last conclusion of that uh, last summer, the, this summer, um, the uh, conviction of the IPCC about the solidity of the link between human activity and warming uh, has become unequivocal. It's not only the global average temperature which is changing, it's also a lot of other um, parameters in the climate system. The CO2 concentration is now the highest in at least the last two million years. Uh, sea level rise is um, happening at a rate that is the fastest rate uh, in at least the last 3,000 years. The Arctic sea ice covering the ocean uh, in the Arctic is at its lowest level in at least the last 1,000 years. Uh, the glaciers are retreating at rates that are unprecedented in at least uh, the last 2,000 years. Just go to Chamonix to uh, look at the Mer de Glace uh, to, 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 to see that. And uh, then a number of extreme events uh, happening either um, at a higher frequency or with more intensity. And the two um, categories of extreme events for which things are the clearest are extreme heat events, um, which are becoming more, more frequent, more intense. Uh, heavy rainfall, uh, as we have repeatedly seen in the world, and now it's not in Europe, at the, at the moment it's in Kerala, Kerala, in India, where they have terrible floods due to very high intensity rainfall uh, as well. Um, but you also have droughts increase in some regions, uh, conditions for fire weather, which we have seen in the southern part of Europe um, uh, the, over the last few summers, which are becoming more frequent. And then ocean warming, acidifying, acidifying and losing oxygen, which is of course not very good for marine life. We know that heat waves are killing. 70,000 people uh, died in 2003 and uh, 1,400 just in Belgium last summer. Not this summer, but uh, the year before. Nobody talked about it, uh, which is a bit surprising, I, I thought. 
But it's also uh, those more intense precipitation which we have seen uh, this summer in Germany, in Belgium, for example. And the basic reason for that is a physical law. Uh, it's called the Clausius Clapeyron law. It's, you cannot change it. You, can, you cannot negotiate with this. Uh, and the law says that with one more degree C, uh, you have seven percent more water vapor in the atmosphere. And therefore, uh, and it's only one of the reasons for more intense rain, when the conditions are met uh, for that water vapor to condense, you have a higher amount of, of rain. And uh, we, we better prepare for that much more everywhere uh, if we want to avoid uh, at least part of the impacts because the uh, destruction that uh, these kind of things can cause is uh, terrible. Now, looking at the, at the future, uh, the IPCC is working with those uh, five key scenarios from the lowest, which is uh, as a name ending with 1.9. It's kind of in the index of uh, uh, warming uh, potential. And the highest is as a name ending with 8.5. You see the, the shape of those scenarios as far as CO2 emissions are concerned, uh, with the lowest one reaching um, close to uh, zero. Uh, by the, indeed the, the, the middle of this century and the top one peaking only uh, at the end uh, of the century. Now, if you feed those scenarios, and of course you have um, evolutions for the other forcing factors as well, like methane, N2O, etc., uh, but CO2 is 80% of the problem, this is what you get in terms of global temperature. Uh, the lowest uh, scenario is able to maintain the warming under 1.5 degrees C limit after a small overshoot uh, in the middle of the century by 0.1 uh, degrees C. But the top scenario, uh, on the other hand, and a few of the others, are clearly um, leading to very high um, uh, levels of warming, but also uh, warming which, has, which is not at all stabilized. I mean, those two stabilized the warming at the end of the century. Uh, those three, um, uh, the warming is still continuing after 2100. Now, if you look at the spatial distribution, this is what you see for different levels of warming. And you see that uh, when you look at those average numbers, you always need to remember that on the continents, on land, it's, of course, always higher because the thermal inertia of the ocean is very high. And also, um, sorry, Mr. Chairman, but your country uh, is close to the Arctic uh, and in the Arctic, um, the warming is much stronger because of the, I mean, one of the reasons is the melting of that uh, sea ice in the Arctic. Increasing uh, intensities of um, uh, heat waves uh, and very hot events is shown by the number of dots uh, for uh, events that today have a frequency of uh, 10 years and you see with the warming how this uh, frequency increases and also the intensity as shown here and for the 50-year events so the event happening today or previously only once every 50 years, you see also uh, an even uh, stronger increase. It's, you also have many uh, aspects of um, precipitation patterns which are changing with, um, on the average, more rain in the northern part of Europe, for example, and less rain in, uh, in the Mediterranean basin and a few other parts of the world with uh, increasing um, frequency of uh, heavy precipitation events uh, uh, following uh, the warming uh, as well. Now, another uh, reason for concern is that the uh, Greenland ice sheet and some of the Antarctic ice sheet is uh, melting uh, more and more, and therefore there's a very high risk that sea level might uh, rise uh, significantly in the coming centuries. This is the volume of water, if you know New York and the Central Park, this is the area of Central Park, the, high, the heights of uh, the tallest skyscrapers, sorry. This is the volume of water, one billion cubic meter, uh, that is lost every day and a half today on average um, by just one ice sheet, and uh, Antarctic ice sheet, and Greenland is actually doing it even faster. So, of course, this contributes to sea level. We have gained up to now approximately 20 centimeters already 
above the uh, level of the uh, beginning of the, the, the 20th century. But for the future, uh, we would get 50 centimeters for the lowest scenario and still a slow increase beyond. But for the top scenario, it's more than one meter with this novelty in the, uh, this summer's report. And that is, it is not excluded because we don't know everything about the behavior of ice sheets, uh, especially for the highest scenario. It's not excluded that, that we would have close to two meters by the end of the century. It's not so far. I mean, it's 80 years from now. Our children uh, will still be there, probably not us, but uh, our children will still be there. Uh, and um, if you go even further in the future, in 2300, sorry, this is uh, um, not readable, 2300, there's a small remark in the report saying that uh, sea level rise greater than 15 meters is not excluded for the top scenario. So it's very clear, and it's another key message, uh, very relevant uh, in, in, um, in, in, in the discussion you'll have today, that every ton of CO2 emissions are adding to global warming because they are increasing that uh, uh, thickness of that insulation layer. There's a very nice, almost linear relationship between the total cumulative CO2 emissions since 1850, which is shown on this axis in billion tons of CO2, and the warming. So every ton of CO2 we emit moves us towards the right on this diagram. Of course, the different scenarios move us more or less uh, to the right of this diagram. And automatically, if you move to the right by adding CO2, you move up uh, in temperature. And you see for 1.5, we're not very far from uh, the limit. That's what's behind the concept of carbon budgets. Another way to look at it is to look at uh, this diagram coming not from the uh, latest IPCC report, but from the um, special report the IPCC published just three years ago in October 2018 on the 1.5 degrees C warming, which concluded that net zero emissions, global emissions, we are at 40 now, uh, should be reached around 2050 if we want to uh, uh, keep the warming below 1.5. And if you look at the, the trend since 1850 uh, for global emissions, this is not coming from the IPCC, this is what you see. Um, and the IPCC report, the uh, Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, up to now, have not succeeded to uh, significantly affect uh, that uh, curve, um, which is best fit by an exponential curve with this annual rate of increase. So this is really um, the reason for concern. This, is, uh, this was also evoked in the opening speech, and it's one of my last slides. Um, this is... Uh, not CO2 only, this is greenhouse gas emissions in CO2 equivalent. Uh, this is the trend on which we were before the Paris Agreement. This is the, the, the trajectory on which we should be leading to zero to, to, towards 2050 if we want to stay below 1.5 degrees CO warming. And this is essentially, I know there has been a, an update recently, but frankly, the update doesn't change much uh, in, in those two results. And this graphic is nicer than the new graphic they've made, so I'm still using this one. Uh, this is uh, the um, uh, result of aggregating all the national plans, which in the jargon are called the NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions, that countries have submitted in the framework of the Paris Agreements. And as you can see, well, yeah, if, it's imp if they are implemented, which remains to be seen, it's a little better if you consider that the average is this uh, white line here. It's uh, in 2025, in 2030, but it's still growing. 2030 is still higher than 2025, and it's both uh, significantly higher than the green curve, uh, which is there. So there's a lot of work, but we still have the choice. We still have the choice whether we want to stay on a trajectory which is not very far from the... Uh, 8.5, or if we want to shoot for 2.6, or even better, 1.9, a world in which um, the warming would be significantly uh, easier to uh, adapt to. 
And I'm convinced, and the IPCC has expressed that uh, in many ways in, in uh, its latest report, that um, acting on climate, which is a sustainable development goal number 13, in the, frame, in the broader framework of the uh, uh, sustainable development goals delivers many uh, synergies. This was not exactly um, one of the messages from this report I brought with me, which I want to draw your attention to, where even though it's 10 years old, it's this special report, uh, but sometimes it's forgotten. Uh, the special report, the IPCC devoted to renewable energy sources and climate change mitigation. It's the same format as your uh, report, uh, almost, and uh, it contains messages uh, which, with other vocabulary, are very similar uh, to the messages uh, you have in, in, in your report uh, today. So, uh, your work is very important. Uh, we know that we have to act uh, quickly and to decarbonize, stop deforestation and store more carbon in soils uh, as soon uh, as possible. It's a huge challenge. We need to transform the world in a few decades so that uh, uh, decarbonization takes place not only in the energy sector but in all human activities, uh, while also achieving the other sustainable development goals uh, uh, eliminating poverty and hunger, providing decent jobs, protecting nature, biodiversity was mentioned in the opening speech. I'm also convinced it's uh, as important as protecting climate. But there are many opportunities uh, in doing that, especially uh, if uh, attention for the uh, potential synergies is given. A just transition to a much more sober and cleaner energy system is urgently needed. Thank you very much for your attention. I will just uh, switch to the a few slides uh, and I will switch quickly to the last one, which is, sorry, can we see the, just the last one, a second? Um, yeah, because on this website, the first one, you'll be able to find the entire uh, PDF uh, of the slides I've shown in the course of the day tomorrow. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vani Persele. This was... Um, well, we didn't expect uh, really good news, uh, but I think it was uh, extremely clear and uh, it shows the daunting challenge that we have uh, in front of us. Um, so once again, thank you very much. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our second keynote with uh, Philip Klose, who is the mayor of the city of Brussels and who will maybe give us uh, some indication of the challenge of decarbonizing a city. So, Mr. Klose, the stage is yours. Thank you. And first of all, I have a very, very short time to prepare this keynote and I have nothing prepared in English. And thank you for the translation, uh, and Adele. And if you can switch for the people who don't understand French, because I'm doing my speech only in French to be the good learn and if they are, everybody can understand what I'm saying, <laughs> because it's very important. So first of all, I would like to thank you, Mr. Van der Perstel. You were one of the people that really gave us awareness how what we do have to implement as policy makers. We are not there only for slogans. No, we are there for urban planning to really have a method. We believe now in this climate change. Maybe there's a lack of awareness about the urgency of the action we have to take. But there's awareness, I must tell you. For a long time, there were doubts, but they've disappeared now. Today, there's a major concern, and in the cities in particular. Why? It's the how. How do we do the transition? We have a great system now in the 21st century with uh, the social security. It helped us during the crisis, the COVID crisis, for example. It helped a lot in the cities in the Western world. Research also has helped with the possibility to get a vaccine in less than a year. Countries, welfare states that were able really to help their economies and help the most vulnerable people. And for this, for uh, social security to be effective, we need 2.5% of growth. 
So this was a, a shock to the uh, policymakers. How can we deliver something different? How can we answer uh, the needs of the citizens? They want more. They want an improved environment. People want a better life and we want to offer well-being to our citizens. So, there is this debate about growth in the societies. It's a debate that is um, criticized. And I must say that at the beginning, we were just working on small aspects for climate change. So changing small habits, for example, individual habits. And I must talk about uh, Mr. Van Nieperzel's uh, PowerPoint presentation. He talked about fight against poverty of the United Nations. It's fighting against inequalities rather than poverty. Also, we have to talk about the fact that our economies that produce, us, produce a lot do emit more pollution. And so if we talk about the fact that we have to capture and recycle waste, well, we produce more waste than other societies. So all these societies have debate on this topic. This is not only about um, the migration. Now we have an economic and climate migration. And there's a now a third point that is talked about by UN, and this is health. In our societies today, we've developed, with uh, a lot of inequalities, a great health network. Life expectancy in Brussels in the 19th century was of 36 years old. What helped improve this? Well, vaccines and hygiene, two major tools, and you know, with the COVID crisis, that these two were really important. There's also the question of access to health care. With Brussels, we have many hospitals. So whatever your budget is, you have access to great health care. Then, fourth point of the UN recommendations, and this is maybe one of the most important ones. It's education. And that's what Mr. Van Ipperzel is, is doing today. We should invest a lot today on educating people because this is what drives our debates. I would like to talk also about the city of Brussels. And I must say that education is the first investment before police, infrastructure, and so on. Education is the uh, budget with the highest amount allocated. Why? Well, because it helps solve many issues and also raise awareness. And you might realize that the people fighting for climate are the cool people, the young people. They are the ones fighting for climate. They are the ones who have uh, raised the voice quite intelligently, without any violence, with a clear message. They've taught children, have talked, young people have talked about climate change, and this is a game changer. This is how we can have a change in the situation. Why am I talking about all of this? Well, because I think that at the beginning of the climate change awareness, there were two mistakes, two major mistakes. First of all, we thought, well, we didn't believe in it. There was a crisis, an energy crisis. In the 2000s, we had a growth again. And then we heard, OK, there's a climate change. Well, they, they were talking about it for a long time, but this is in 2000, around the 2000s, that we were said there's a major issue with uh, climate change. So the first thing we, we, we did at the Brussels city, and this was a mistake, we decided to insulate buildings. But we offered premiums and helps to uh, insulate only to uh, the, le the owners. But in Brussels, only 40% of the people 
own their own building. It means that 60% only are, are renting, so they do not have access to this support. And so we had a group of people that were the climate forgotten, as we call them, people that are quite vulnerable and are in precarious situation. They do not have access to this, these supports. So we fought for different things. And for example, we've talked about um, social housing. And it, it might be a difficult term to mention because social housing is quite uh, criticized. We, we might say that there are ghettos and so on. And in Belgium, often you would start with a, when you start your career, you have uh, a, a home that costs not too much. But now with the situation today, we have people that have to pay more for energy bills than for the rent with major impact on pollution. I, I don't want to, to give figures because uh, maybe um, Mr. Van Impersel will say that I'm not giving you the right figures, but it would be around 50% of this that creates pollution. So we've decided to invest 75 million euros to insulate social housing. And this is part of uh, sustainable development. Because sustainable development is not only about env environment, it's also about social and economy aspects. So do not forget about the social aspect. So, of course, with this uh, measure, we could improve economy, we could improve environment with less uh, waste, energy wasted, but also we help these poor populations. And I was giving you this example because to me, this is how we should see the climate crisis. We've seen the floods in Wallonia. Who are the people that are the more impacted? Well, the ones with uh, the smallest budget, of course. They do not find another home. So these are the people that are the most affected by this crisis. Today, we have societies that are peaceful. There are social conflicts, of course. But, okay, let's say that at least for 10, 15 years, and we can see the different maps, the geopolitics, it's a peaceful society. But I can tell you that I, I'm a, I am scared today. I'm scared of the gap between the people who want to live with electric cars, very expensive electric cars with um, waste management, with the ability to uh, travel differently, and the others that will stay enclosed in their own neighborhood that will be a real trap for them. They will be enclosed there with no um, way of getting out of it. So really now we need to share the progress with all our, of our citizens. And this starts with education. We have a role here. We have to discuss with the young generation and they are there to raise the voice and ask answers on climate change. So we have really to redistribute the resources. Yes. We were talking about social security. It was created just after the Second World War. And it's not, uh, it's important to understand that it's about redistributing resources, financial resources. So this model will not be perfect. There will be a fracture, but we need to understand it and work on it. Otherwise, we will keep having a planet that is producing, producing and producing, while do not thinking about the pollution. We know that today, we consume more in a society, in a richer society, richer society than in a poorer society. So we have to work on this. And Europe has a role to play, really, on this matter. Because as of today, if you look at all the member states, the European member states, there's an improvement, really. So my message is this one. It's quite simple. There's not a there shouldn't be a debate between climate and growth, but we need a different growth. And this different growth should be based on redistribution of resources. We should not forget the as social aspect. We should be able to impact all 
the layers of the society. We are a very rich city in Brussels, but we've also very poor neighborhoods that are really in the center of the city. So all of our citizens should be able to get access to this uh, increase in revenues. So my message is this one. Keep thinking, keep proposing solutions, because us as public authorities, we also need your proposals. We use the proposals of the people that intervene, talk to us, and we should keep inventing solutions. And what I'm talking about with redistributing the resources, I'm talking also about a notion that is very important to the new generation, the sharing generation. For example, I call them the Spotify generation. They do not want to own things anymore. They do not want to own their music, they don't want to own their videos, their bikes, they share them, they share the, 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 the transportation, the, it's, we, we see public transportation being used more and more, but there are also adverse effects to that. For example, Airbnb, we thought it would be something positive and it was at the end of the day quite negative for uh, the housings. So these people, this generation, they do not want to own, they want to share. So we might, with great thinking around this, and some of the thinking we, we take uh, comes from the COVID crisis, because we decided to see things differently. For example, we cannot say we will not build anything. No, that's not possible. No, what we want is to build differently. For example, if we have infrastructure such as a meeting room or a school uh, gym, we have to maybe think about the way we use it, maybe use it differently and use them when they are not in use. If we see all the buildings we have, the usage rate is not high at all. They are all dedicated on to only one task. So maybe we could share also the infrastructures so that all the layers of the society can get more. We just redistribute the resources. We don't want to consume more. And if we can also implement a sharing economy in all the spaces, public, private, we will get, I think, and that was the beginning of my introduction, we will get to the well-being of our populations. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Mr. Claude. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Claude, for this uh, very interesting intervention. And, and I think the two keynotes were um, really um, extremely insightful. Um, I think Mr. Van Ypersel reminded us uh, the daunting challenge we have in front of us and the extreme emergency uh, of, of fighting against the climate change. Uh, I think this is clear to everybody. I will come to that uh, a little bit uh, later on. <clears throat> it was very interesting to listen to uh, Mr. Close and, and I liked very much um, uh, his approach to the transition, uh, which definitely shows that the transition, uh, first of all, is, is a social transition. And this is, by the way, a, a very important element in the EU policy because we always speak about a fair and just transition. But uh, I would say beyond this aspect, I think it was very clear that it is a question of transitioning the society. It's not about implementing strategy, more efficiency in buildings. It's about rethinking the models. And I think the, the examples you have given about the new generation, which is a sharing generation, replacing assets by services, the notion of sharing mobility, sharing devices, sharing assets, um, it certainly will, will lead us to rethink very significantly the way our society is, um, is working. Uh, and last but not least, I think it was extremely important to point out the critical role of education because everything starts with education. And why is it so difficult to implement the change today is because the change has to come from people who have an old education, such as myself, by the way. So, um, <clears throat> where is the, here is it. So it is uh, really my pleasure um, now to um, introduce the work that we have been doing at ERA. 
and in particular the white paper on the clean energy transition. Why we have done that is precisely because coming from a technology-centric organization, we realize that the transition is about technology, which are key enabling technology for the or key, key enablers for the transition. But in order for this technology to be implemented and properly used, we need radically to transform our society. So it's a societal transformation that we're talking about. And this is the reason why uh, we have changed the mission of our uh, organization, as was pointed out by uh, our president, Mr. Rocker. Um, our, our mission today is really to support the transition, the European transition to a climate neutral society. Before, we were looking just at being the best experts in low carbon technology. Now we're looking at the society as a whole. What does it take? Well, we need the, the, the technologies, as I said. So the idea is really to capitalize on this expertise and this excellence that we have in the technologies, but to build upon the understanding of what is a transformative process of the society we need to reach or, let's say, to get as close as possible to a climate uh, neutral society. Um, in a nutshell, uh, we're an, organ an organization which catalyzes energy research and how we do that across Europe is uh, by having joint programs. These are permanent uh, platforms where researchers uh, from institutes across Europe work together on joint research agenda. And uh, at the moment, we have 18 uh, of these uh, joint programs. Two are on enabling technologies, are looking at materials, which are really fundamental in energy technologies. Uh, 10 are looking at the classical low carbon technologies um, that we all know. And very importantly, we have one third of our activity, six programs, which are looking more at the systemic uh, uh, aspects of the transition and also at some of the cross-cutting uh, aspects. This is extremely important because the transition is not about just you know, pushing the deployment of a technology, it's changing the system so that the overall system would become climate neutral, which is a totally different challenge. Um, <clears throat> I will not spend too, too much time on, on some of the figures which, uh, we've already, which were already presented, but this one is really impressive. What is the speed of the transition globally today? Because we tend to see a little bit what is happening in Europe, and we know, for instance, that in Europe, most of the new capacity additions were renewables, which is a very good thing. But if we look at the world globally, what is happening, and you see here the evolution over uh, almost 30 years, you see that the uh, primary energy demand has not changed at all. The thin, very thin yellow uh, layer that you see in the middle are the new renewables. So it doesn't take into consideration hydropower or, or classical biomass. So it's wind, typically it's wind and solar. It represents less than 5% of the primary energy demand. It's ridiculous. It's, it's not visible. This is noise. So it means that despite all the efforts that we've done the hundreds of uh, gigawatt of capacity which were installed in Europe, but also in other places of the world, the energy mix is still almost the same, which is highly dominated by coal, black uh, on the top, and by uh, oil and gas. So in fact, we could say that at the global scale, transition is not happening. Simply, it's not happening. If I look now, um, what is the reality um, from the atmosphere perspective? And uh, this one, I think, is, is very similar from, uh, to one of the slides shown by uh, Professor Vanny Perseler. Um, it shows that, in fact, the emissions uh, have been constantly growing. This is, this, these are the global emissions. Uh, has been constantly growing until today. If we accept the COVID crisis, I will come uh, back to that. There is one dip also, which is, uh, which is the financial crisis in 2008, which, by the way, shows very clearly the immediate uh, link between the economic growth and uh, the global emissions. What you see here is that if we continue on business as usual, emissions will, will grow, and we're probably in scenarios which would lead us above three to four degrees Celsius. If we look at the pledges under the Paris Agreement, which is the first, um, the first part here, I don't know if the pointer works here. Uh, no, it doesn't show, so you see it here. 
if they were fully implemented, all the pledges we know today, all the net zero pledges, if they are fully implemented today, they would lead only to a 40% decrease of the emissions. But you see that the result is that the emissions will be basically flattening uh, over time. And this would lead us, as uh, Mr. Van Impozelo has shown, to more than two degrees Celsius glo uh, average global warming by the end of the century. If we look at what are the pledges that are, we hope uh, will be confirmed in the uh, COP26 conference in Glasgow, we would only reach minus 60%. So it means that in the best case scenario today, the political commitment falls short of 40% uh, of the emissions to be cut by uh, mid-century. So, and we know that these are political pledges. We know that the reality is very different. We have seen that emissions are not declining since the Paris Agreement entered into force. So we see that we're very far away from any situation that would lead us to, to get close to 1.5 degree warming, which we know is probably the threshold we should not uh, go above. So what does it mean? Because we speak about uh, 40%, 50%, 60%. Um, I think this was evoked earlier, um, the COVID crisis. Last year, uh, the world economy has been brought mostly to a standstill. Almost everything was stopped. The factories, the manufacturing, the, uh, all the planes were grounded. Uh, people were locked down in their homes. So the activity was almost stopped for most of the year. It's very surprising to see that the impact on the global emissions has been, and this is an estimate of the uh, International Energy Agency, was less than 6%. So by stopping all human activity virtually across the world during one year, we reduced emissions only by 6%. Now, if you look the curve on the uh, right-hand side, it's the net zero scenario from the IEA. What does it show? It shows, you see the dip here, um, of the 6%. But if you want to get to zero by 2050, you can calculate very easily what is the decrease in emissions that you need year on year. And if you calculate it, you see that between 2000, in this decade, between 2020 and 2030, you need to decrease at an average rate of 5% per year. So it means that in the next decade, if we want to be serious about net zero, we should transform the society with an impact which would be comparable. Of course, it's a figure, but with an impact which is comparable to what has happened last year. And this should happen year on year cumulatively for the next 10 years. It's just, just unbelievable. If you look at the next year, because we always tend to, to see this as something more or less linear, this is not at all true. In fact, here, the decrease, the relative decrease will be doubled, of course. And so it, need, it means that in the next decade, we'll need to decrease by 11% per year, and then increasing, of course, up to 100% at the end. So we need to have double the effect of the COVID crisis year on year in the next decade. It's just daunting as a challenge. And this is precisely what we thought it was important to uh, write a white paper to reflect on what are the ways in which we could change the situation where constantly emissions are increasing. So um, <coughs> the first thing we, we, uh, we thought was um, what do we need to address in, uh, in, in this report to look at um, uh, the system as a whole. And if, in, in fact, if you think about the transition, um, everything that we do in our life has a very significant impact on what we emit, everything, what we eat, where we live, the way we move, every activity that we do for entertaining oneself, the way we consume. Let's not forget that in Belgium, the cycle time for smartphone is uh, uh, a year and a half. This is just incredible. And the way we produce, of course. So every aspect of society needs to be reconsidered in trying to tackle uh, the emissions. And we have attempted to have a definition of the clean energy transition, which is a very fundamental concept in the EU policy, but which has never been defined. And you see our proposed definition in the box on the right-hand side. So, 
The white paper um, is really an attempt to um, provide advice, um, but an innovative way, um, and um, I would say a, 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 quite, a, a quite creative uh, approach to how policy making can be done in order to tackle the societal dimension of the energy transition. So first of all, we have taken a holistic view. So we need to understand the society as a whole. It's not about the energy system only. <clears throat> if you look only at emissions which are produced by the power and heat sector, they are only about one, one third of the global emissions. Emissions come from mostly the use of energy everywhere in what we do also outside of the energy production sector. It needs to be systemic. In fact, the society is a system, and if you change the, uh, anything at one point of the system, it will affect all other points of the system. So you cannot reflect in silos by looking individually at a certain activity, a certain technology, or a certain sector. You need to, to, to look at all. And one of the of the consequence of that is that we need fundamentally to have a cross-sectoral approach. We cannot look only at the electricity sector, or the power sector, or the heat sector. We need to look at all sectors as a whole and look at ways, smart ways to net zero emission across all the sectors. And last but not least, it's fundamentally interdisciplinary. We have uh, heard in the, in the uh, keynotes, the first keynote, uh, second keynote speech, that it's about every aspect of the society. So it's not only about the way we produce and use energy, it's also about regulations, it's also about the way we measure things, so the market models, the business models, it's about the way we consume, so it's about lifestyles, it's about culture, and we need to embrace all these aspects in the policy making process. So, the core of uh, the white paper is to provide a conceptual methodological framework to approach um, policy making in a holistic way in order to drive the clean energy transition. And so the first thing is to address emissions from where they come, not from one sector. And we've started by looking at all the sectors in the uh, definition of the IPCC, and I speak under the control of, Mr. Vani, of Professor Vanny Persdale, of course. So heat and power, what we call the energy sector, but of course, industry, building, transportation, and also uh, agriculture, land use, and uh, forestry. The idea is that only if you look at all these scenarios in combination, you can design transition scenarios. And why there are many transition scenarios? Because definitely, these will be very dependent on the boundary conditions. The situation of countries like Finland, for instance, with five and a half million people, um, the transition scenarios might be very different from those in Belgium, which is a country which is 11 times smaller and with double of the population and with no, uh, almost no uh, natural resources and a strong transportation hub. So transition scenario will be fundamentally different depending on the boundary conditions and I would say the EU uh, transition will be a smart integration of these uh, scenarios. Now how do we build the scenarios? we structure them by looking at a number of fundamental structuring themes. And what is interesting to see here is that when you look at these themes, it's not about technology. It's about how we organize ourselves in the society. It's, of course, about the digitalization, which is a key enabler in changing our business models. It's about circularity, efficiency, and sufficiency. We know that efficiency and circularity have limitations. This is, this, is, uh, this is a given, it's, it's scientifically demonstrated. We need to think about sufficiency. Efficiency is about changing your old elevator by a new elevator. Sufficiency is wondering if you should not change your elevator by a staircase. So you provide the same service, but with less energy intensity. Sector coupling, I, came, uh, I touched upon that, this is fundamental, but I think this is very central to all what we do uh, uh, here, so I will not spend too much time. Of course, policy regulations and markets, this is fundamental. When we read the last report of, uh, of the IEA, uh, the, the World Energy Outlook, uh, Fatih Birol says, well, 40% of, of the emissions abatement to 2050 can be done on a cost-effective way. So it means that markets, if they are perfect, would be able to drive this. 
but it also means that 60% will not be cost effective. And the only way to do that is through regulations. We cannot expect the markets to drive us alone to net zero. So regulations and policy are absolutely fundamental. And finally, it's about energy citizenship. It's about the practice, the buying patterns, the way what, what I've shown, the way you eat, the way you move, the way you consume. And this is really fundamental because if you don't address this aspect, the transition will just not happen. Just look at what has happened three years ago um, in France with the Gilets Jaunes. You just change a little bit the price of a diesel, everybody was in the street. Why? Because it was not perceived as it should have been perceived. It was perceived just as a tax which was unbearable by, um, by a, a large portion of the people. What you need to do is to use the citizen to pull the transition and to aspire to the transition. And the only way you can do that is not by imposing a set of measures through regulations, through laws, but it's really about designing a narrative a narrative on the transition. You need to give to the people the, 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 the way to project themselves in an imaginary future which is desirable. They need to project how they, how, why this change will provide them a better life in the future. If you don't achieve this possibility, it will be impossible to drive the transition because um, uh, people will, will be reacting to any, any change. So the, the, the clean energy transition narrative is, in our view, an absolutely fundamental tool to drive the transition and to get the buy-in of the citizens. I've discussed about the transition scenarios. Now, how all this relates into research and innovation challenges, into the technologies we need to develop. And this is also one of the uh, key elements of the white paper. Uh, the point is, at the moment, we often look into, we look from a bottom-up perspective. So we look at technologies and we try to develop technologies which are the most effective and try to figure out what could be the impact of this technology on uh, uh, the global energy mix. This is a way of doing, but you can never, of course, assert that you're developing the right technology at the right time, and you can never assert that the combination of this technology will bring you where you want to be. So this is the reason you need to adopt both a top-down and a bottom-up approach. And the way to do that is to define transition challenges. So the question of, uh, uh, should not be how much uh, batteries, how much hydrogen uh, do we need? The question is to identify what are the major challenges that we need. And the way you will resolve the challenge will be fundamentally dependent on the boundary conditions. For instance, an, an, an example of transition challenge would be to have reliable, uh, resilient, um, and uh, flexible energy networks. It doesn't say if it's power, if it's heat, if it's gas. You need to have these networks. The way it will translate in a specific situation might entail a number of technology, be it hydrogen, be it, be it, be it uh, uh, batteries, be it demand side management, be it smart grids and so on. But the idea is really to identify what are the key challenges that we need to resolve, which are broadly defined um, in order to be able to sustain the transition scenarios. And um, I think I've come to an end. Um, <clears throat> what we, the paper proposes um, based on this approach is um, about 20 policy recommendations, uh, where, uh, which are uh, divided into uh, 11 headings that are shown here. I will not, for the sake of time, go into each of those. But first, the first one, and I think this is a fundamental one, we need the citizens to embrace and to drive the transition. And for this, we need to have an appealing clean energy transition narrative. We need, we need a right storytelling. And this will be, um, in fact, the, uh, the, the, the subject of the first panel that we are gonna have just after my intervention. Another one, uh, and it's, it's the last one, it's strategically um, increased international collaboration. This is quite obvious. I think uh, Nils Hocke uh, has evoked uh, uh, the, the IEA statement about the absolute need to, to gear up uh, uh, international collaboration. This will be 
uh, the, the subject of the second panel we're going to have after the coffee break. It's about uh, how, and we'll, we'll be looking uh, here at the European perspective, how can we increase the level of collaboration at EU level. And we'll introduce the, the, um, uh, the notions of sector of excellence. If I go to number two, it's about the investments in research and innovation. And I've used the word multiply investment. It's not increase. It's not about having 10% more, 20% more. It's about tripling or quadrupling what we're doing today. It's changing the scale, the order of magnitude. We need to develop much faster a whole set of new technologies. We know that half of the abatements after 2030 will come from technologies which are not yet on the market today. So we need to develop them now. We need to invest now to have them in 10 years from now. Um, and this must happen across all TRLs. We have the tendency now to look only at the higher TRLs which will have an impact in the three to five years. We need to feed the, the uh, innovation funnel. So we need to invest in low TRL which will provide the technologies in the 10 and 20 years to come. Third point is about defragmenting policy making. Absolutely fundamental. As I said, um, if you continue to work across the silos which are, which are reflecting the structure of a society, you cannot address the systemic nature of the transformation which is at stake. And I think a very good example of uh, defragmenting the, uh, the, the policy maker making is, is uh, given by the EU Green Deal, because this is already an example of a policy package which goes across the different disciplines and sectors and technologies. And then um, number eight, reduce energy demand. This is about sufficiency. This is absolutely fundamental. We know we can increase efficiency, but as long as we will be increasing significantly the energy demand, we know that we'll, it will be more and more challenging to reach net zero. So we need to reflect at all ways to reduce the energy consumption. And this leads to the, the notion of sufficiency that I've mentioned uh, earlier. And then last point, and I think this one is very important. We need, first of all, to step up the level of ambition. Clearly, the policies, even the most ambitious, are not enough ambitious. We, we have seen it on the graph. Uh, Professor Van Ipersdele has been very clear on that. So we need to step up the level of ambition globally. Let's also remember that Europe only represents 8% of the global emissions. And we need to challenge the dominance of the current economic paradigm. This is absolutely fundamental. We will not achieve net zero or will not even get close to net zero if we leave it only to the market to do it. We need to regulate. I can give a very simple example. In France, um, they will soon just by uh, regulation ban all the short haul um, uh, air flights, which can be replaced by, by a train uh, in, in less than, I think, five hours or so. This is the kind of regulation that we need. Because if you leave it only to the market, you will always find low-cost companies which will propose you uh, uh, flights uh, cheaper than the train as it is today. So the market cannot do it alone. We need strong regulation. Remember, approximately 60% of the emissions cut will come from measures which are not, in our current model, cost competitive. So this will close my uh, speech. I thank you very much for your attention. And um, I think we will come uh, to uh, the first panel, which uh, is about the um, narrative. How do we build a narrative on the clean energy transition? So this panel uh, will be moderated uh, by Lynn Govart, who is uh, Executive Vice President of ERA, and who will be introducing the uh, esteemed uh, panelists. Um, well, we, I will introduce the second panel as well. Well, you can already come. Um, which uh, include um, esteemed members from the Commission, from the Parliament, and from the civil society. The second panel that I already introduced will be after the coffee break, and it will be moderated by uh, Teresa uh, Pons, or uh, second vice president of ERA, we have only two, and uh, it will be devoted to how we um, uh, scale up international collaboration and we'll be discussing on the subject of uh, centers of excellence. So, uh, without further ado, Lane, the stage is yours. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you Adele for this introduction. Also thanks to the keynote speakers who opened the scene um, very clear on the sense of urgency on climate change. But also I welcome very much the um, reflections of the mayor of Brussels who introduced the necessity of keeping all on board and um, making the just transition. So I would like to invite all panelists to take a seat over here. Um, we have first uh, Philippe Lambert, member of the European Parliament for the Green Party. Yes, please take a seat. Um, we have uh, Rosalinde van der Vlies, um, Director of Clean Planet of DG RTD in the European Commission. We have Stefan Vergoten, who is advisor uh, at DG Klima, also at the European Commission. We have uh, Thomas Pellerin Carlin, director of Jacques Delors Energy Center. And uh, we have Monique Hoyes, uh, director general of BEUC, uh, consumer organization. We also have uh, Nils with us, um, who uh, opened also the uh, setting today. So thanks all for joining us in this debate. The challenge to transform our society and economy in the coming de decades is daunting, as was introduced today. As sketched uh, by um, Adele, we made a blueprint for the clean energy transition, which was published in our white paper. I hope you all had the opportunity to read it. And one of the mayor, um, major proposals that we make and recommendations is that there is a strong need for a clean energy transition narrative. Let's say a storyline which is essential to align all stakeholders on this path and uh, make it an appealing story for all. An appealing story for policymakers, industries, investors and last but not least our citizens. To leave no one behind is crucial in the transition we envisage. I would like to invite all panelists to start with a short introduction and an opening statement of about five minutes on how this clean energy transition narrative could be built and how it will contribute to the transition which is essential to make in the coming decades. Maybe I first start um, with Philippe Lambert. Sorry, no, he's not here. Ah, yeah, sir. Oh, it's remote, sorry. Didn't see you yet, um, Mr. Lambert. Please, uh, the floor is yours for um, a statement on the clean energy transition narrative. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, not yet. Not yet. No. A bit louder, please. Well? Okay. okay. Yes, it's fine. I'm all set. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Good. Uh, well, when I hear the word narrative, uh, I tend to turn away because that's a way uh, to say, well, basically, the people understand so we have to tell them a good story and now they will understand and they will be with us. Uh, well I don't agree with that. Uh, I believe that all citizens are not stupid. They, they see that we have a daunting challenge ahead of us uh, but they recall from it because well, first we are all uh, uh, change averse and second uh, uh, this does not happen in a vacuum. It happens in a, in a society where inequality has been driven up uh, by 40 years of neoliberal policies and so basically people feel that they have been screwed by the system first uh, on economic terms now they are being screwed by the system on, on, in environmental terms and well uh, they are uh, afraid that the transition will be just a third occasion to screw them again so uh, any narrative if you want to use that word needs to address this and i don't believe that a narrative will be enough uh, let me put it this way, when Winston Churchill had to uh, galvanize the United Kingdom into uh, continuing the struggle against Nazi Germany at a time where the United Kingdom was pretty much alone, the narrative went as such, uh, as, as follows. Basically, I can only promise you blood, sweat and tears, so it won't be an easy ride, but the good news is that we, co we might come out uh, winning this one. And that is basically the narrative. So we are facing an existential challenge. It's going to be rough. So those who tell you that you can have a smooth, uh, uh, a nice transition, we could have had that if we had started basically 1972 when the Beyond Growth report of the Club of Rome was published. Is by then we had started acting, we might have had a smooth transition. By now, it's way too late to have a smooth transition. So yes, we, we need to galvanize society into a massive effort. And the only way to convince people to do it 
uh, the alternative being, well, enjoy the party while, while it lasts and then we're all, uh, uh, we're all going to die. Uh, the only way to convince people to do that is not just to tell them a story, is to show that we are going to make sure that those who have the broadest shoulders will contribute their uh, fair share of the effort. And that fair share will be immense. In other terms, uh, the current economic system is predicated on the massive exploitation of the planet, of the living beings, including human beings uh, on this planet. So you cannot have at the same time, and this is where I disagree with the statement, we, we must leave no one behind, uh, because it gives the impression that actually we should please everyone. Those who still expect uh, 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 financial returns of, uh, of, uh, of the kind that we have enjoyed, well, they have enjoyed uh, the last uh, uh, 30, 40 years, uh, well, we must tell them the party is over, over and finished. And so if you still expect that, well, we have bad news for you because uh, uh, we are going to make sure that earning that kind of money will no longer be possible. And so you may like this and then you're welcome on board the transition. You don't like it, too bad for you. Uh, because, well, indeed regulation, and that is tax regulation, that is, uh, well, putting limits on the exploitation of the planet, will make sure that the kind of returns that you expect won't be possible any longer and will be made basically illegal. So that's where uh, I would say the buck stops in terms of having everyone on board. But I know that those who say that usually say we, we shouldn't leave the, the weak behind. And there, I totally agree. But you cannot at the same time please the people you call improperly, I think, the investors, what I call uh, the rent seekers, you can't please them and please uh, the wider population. This is just impossible. It's either or. Uh, back in 1940, it was Nazi Germany. Uh, uh, nowadays, it's the, 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 the cast of the rent seekers who are ba basically making the planet unlivable uh, for human beings. And that is the kind of things that we need to do. Now, what is the difficulty? The difficulty is that most of the environmental regulation levers uh, that we have are situated competence-wise at the European Union level. But most of the levers that we have to improve or correct uh, income and wealth distribution are at national level. That's the taxation system, the organization of the labor market, highly crucial because this organizes the pre-distribution of income. The way you organize a, a, a labor market has an influence on the market power of job seekers versus job uh, 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 offers. Um, and, uh, and finally, the uh, social security system. These are the three main levers, and these are at national level. And so if you want to have co a compelling story, you have to show, to show, and not just promise, show that you are reducing income inequality. Why did we have the, and I, that's my final word, why did we have the, 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 the yellow jackets in France uh, uh, three years ago? Because Right. Well, the, the, the rise in, 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 diesel, uh, uh, in, in diesel prices came right after the abolition of the wealth tax. And that is, of course, an insult to people. I mean, if you make the taxation system even less redistributive, even more unjust, and then you rise energy prices, people will kill you. They will mobilize, and rightfully so. So what the narrative is just showing by tax reforms, market labor, uh, uh, labor market reforms, and social security reforms that we are actually starting to reduce inequality to convince people that this is serious. We are going to reduce our ecological footprint at the same time as we are reducing income and wealth inequality. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lambert, uh, on challenging us that the storyline won't be enough. Um, I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Rosalinde van der Vlies to give her thoughts on the storyline and also the call for action that um, Philippe Lambert uh, raised. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everybody. Oh, I the microphone. Maybe better indeed. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I would like to take as a starting point for the storyline um, the Horizon Europe program, which we have now in Europe. It's the biggest program for research and innovation ever, with 95.5 billion euros that we will be investing at EU level in research and innovation for the next seven years. And I think the changed storyline starts from this program. Already when we made an evaluation of the seventh framework program, 
one of the conclusions was that we need to bring science closer to the citizens. And that was basically a very important conclusion for the new design of Horizon Europe. And I would like to highlight three elements of the programme uh, that can feed into this new narrative. The first one is that we go for a cross-sectoral approach. So when it comes to energy, we now have a specific cluster in the program, cluster five covering energy, climate and mobility. We will have 15 million euros to be investing in like these cross-sectoral solutions. I think that's the first very important change that we made compared to the past. The second one is that we really started to focus on impact. We have been driven sometimes a bit by the different tools that we have at our disposal. So now there's a very clear focus on impact in Horizon Europe. And this means, for instance, that when we partner up with industry, what we have been doing for many years under many different framework programs, the partnerships under Horizon Europe now have this very clear impact focus. So this means that we need to make sure that the investments that we are making also together with industry really deliver on accelerating the transition towards climate neutrality. Because with the European Green Deal, we now have a very clear political ambition for the entire European Union. And this is something that all the citizens understand. Europe wants to be the first climate neutral continent by 2050. This is a really good story. And I also think we can be proud that we in the European Union have set ourselves this longer term ambition. So we need to make sure that now everything we do from the Commission side, whether it will be regulatory revisions to the regulatory framework, which is our famous Fit for 55 packages, and also the investments that we are making, amongst others through Horizon Europe, it all will contribute to realizing this very important ambition. Now, going back to Horizon Europe, we also introduced a new instrument, uh, which are called the Horizon Europe missions, which were launched by the end of September. Now, if I just, out of curiosity, by raise of hands, whom of you have not heard about these missions? Oh, thank God. At least here in Brussels, we are doing something right. But the idea behind these Horizon Europe missions is really that we are getting closer to the citizens, that we explain that we need to address our global challenges together through concrete solutions. And I would like to zoom in on one particular mission, which is the mission for climate neutral and smart cities. Because this mission has a very clear target. We want to have at least 100 climate neutral cities in the European Union by 2030. And we want these cities to become experimentation and innovation hubs in order to also pull other cities in the European Union towards climate neutrality by 2050. Now, the novelty here is that we want to design and implement this mission in a bottom-up way together with citizens. So all the cities that will be participating in this mission, um, they are asked to design climate neutral contracts for the city, but to design those in co-creation with the people that actually live in the cities. So because we really feel that if we want to go to climate neutrality, and I think it was also very well underlined uh, uh, in the report that was presented before, technological solutions that are available, that are brought to the market, that are scaled up, are not enough. We need the buy-in from the citizens. We need to make sure that the citizens, they felt part of the story. And this is where I want to conclude. I think if we want to build this narrative, it's extremely important this narrative is not imposed but it's co-designed together with the citizens. And that's why the European Union will be investing a lot in stake organizing stakeholder in co-creation events with citizens. And a very concrete example here is indeed the city's mission. So when we will be rolling out the city's mission across the European Union, we really want to have these bottom-up workshops and engagement activities with citizens in order to make sure that they are part of the narrative and that they feel they can design the narrative themselves, that they have a say in this narrative. Maybe one last element I would like to highlight, which is beyond Horizon Europe, but this is an initiative that is very close to the heart of our president, Mrs. von der Leyen, and that is the new European Bauhaus. This is a movement um, that was uh, started uh, by uh, our president because he really felt that you know, our transition towards climate neutrality shouldn't only be sustainable, but also needs to be inclusive and also beautiful. 
Uh, and this is part of the new European Bauhaus movement. Uh, as part of the Horizon Europe cities, we will be launching five lighthouse projects where we will be integrating new European Bauhaus projects inside the implementation of the missions. And in particular for the city's mission, it's very clear that we can have, as part of the city's mission, a transition towards climate neutrality, but also in a way that is appealing and aesthetically for our citizens. So this is my introduction. I would like to stop here, but I'm very much looking forward to the debate. Okay, thank you, thank you Mr. Sanderlis. <laughs> now I maybe would like to ask uh, Mr. Pellerin Carlin from the Jacques Delors uh, think tank uh, to share his ideas on um, how a clean energy transition narrative should look like and how it can help us move forward. Thank you very much for the, the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Um, I, I will be trying to answer four questions. Uh, a narrative for whom? What should be a narrative? What should be the pieces of the narrative? And finally, how can we build it? So the first question is a narrative for whom? Um, Mr. Lambert, for instance, uh, assumed that it was a narrative for citizens. Um, yes, it is, but not only. Um, it can be also a narrative for business leaders. What is the kind of narrative that we convince Patrick Pouyanné, the CEO of Total, to actually fully engage in the transition? Uh, what could be a narrative that would convince mainstream politicians we have done in their career little about climate, including Ursula von der Leyen, including Olaf Scholz, uh, including Emmanuel Macron, to make climate a priority, something that is partially done in uh, Brussels today, but not done yet uh, in Paris or in Berlin. So that's the first question I think we should answer. And I think a good narrative is a narrative that speaks ideally to everybody, or at least the 99% of the people. Um, so what should be then this narrative? Ideally, we would have a coherent storyline with several subplots. You may remember uh, a wonderful movie that was published in the 90s uh, by Ayao Miyazaki uh, called Princess Mononoke. Um, what makes this movie tremendous, I see a few people nodding their heads, they, they love that movie like I do. Among the many things that is great about that movie is there's so many stories that are there. First and foremost, it's a story about a teenager achieving personal growth becoming a man. It's also a story of the struggles between humans and nature. It's also the story of industrialization in feudal Japan. And it is also a story about uh, a woman, Lady Eboshi, who is trying to build a safe heaven for the people that are marginalized in the society. And that, there are actually other elements also in that movie. I think we should draw inspiration from that because a narrative in the end is always a work of fiction. But we humans do need those fictions to be able to cooperate together. We created a lot of very successful fictions of the time. One of those being, you know, money. I give a piece of paper and someone does something for me. And I do a stuff for people and then they give me some pieces of paper on which, you know, like 50 euros or something, something like that. But that's a fiction that we've created, but it's an extremely useful fiction to make sure we cooperate. So what could be the pieces of that narrative that would ensure uh, that we cooperate and that we go along in the same direction, in the diversity of who we are as citizens, as business leaders, as engineers, um, as you know, climate activists, as trade unionists, etc. cetera. Um, let me propose four pieces of that puzzle and feel free to add really and anyone, as long as it stays in a coherent uh, storyline. First, you know, I'm thinking, you know, what, what could be the main element of the narrative that would talk to my father and, and, and my mother? And I think it would be one of protection. We are doing this to protect ourselves from the greatest impact of climate change. That means climate change mitigation to limit the worst impact of climate change after 2050, but that's also protecting people today from you know, uh, the impacts that climate change already has. A second piece of the puzzle could be inclusion. Uh, very much like Mr. Lambert, I dislike the term leave no one behind before a different reason than him. Because what this term says, leaving no one behind implicitly, is that no one has been left behind already. But the fossil fuel system that is extremely inefficient has left tens of millions of Europeans behind. 
the people the mayor of Brussels was talking about, the people who currently in Brussels can't afford to heat themselves properly, it's not because of the green transition, it's because of the, of the fuel, fossil fuel system, of inefficient policies that were implemented in Belgium and in Europe uh, in the 60s, the 70s and the 80s. So here to me the key word is not leaving the one behind but inclusion, making sure that those who were left behind in the 20th century are including in uh, the energy system of the 21st century. A third piece of the puzzle could be technological progress. That's something that is still a powerful narrative in our society, especially uh, among some engineers, but also uh, a lot of politicians and business leaders. But here, we should think, obviously, of the failure of technological progress in Europe in the 20th century, what it brought us that was extremely negative for our society. So it's not only about you know, thinking that a new technology is always good. It's thinking about humane technological progress. That goes obviously beyond the issue of climate. We can think of digital, <laughs> uh, just to, to have that in mind. But this is also true for climate. And so here, that's the duty uh, of innovators and engineers, people that are hands-on uh, when it comes to the technologies, understand what we need as humans, and then understand what we need to develop to build a technology that is useful to humans, first and foremost. And this kind of narrative on technological progress you know, could speak to people like Bill Gates, people like Emmanuel Macron, those people that we also need to be uh, on, on board as part of the narrative. And the fourth and last piece of the puzzle would be geopolitical independence. I mean, we've realized again uh, over the last, uh, the last week uh, that you know, we rely a lot on Russian gas and we rely a lot on Saudi oil. So let's get rid of that and let's build European technologies uh, European products uh, that can ensure that in Europe we use European energy in order uh, to fulfill um, our needs. And this is, for instance, a narrative that can speak to the current Polish Prime Minister, Mateusz Morawiecki. And we also need him to be part of the clean energy transition narrative. So let me end on how can we build that. If you have low ambitions, do that with people that are so quote unquote experts, but especially uh, people who can think outside the box do have science fiction authors, for instance, uh, work with them to think what kind of a narrative could be appealing to people. Uh, and if you have high ambitions, do that with citizens. I spent my entire weekend actually with a uh, hundred French citizens uh, who were gathered in Paris by the French government. We talked about those and I heard them and they had a lot to say. Uh, and so, um, I mean, the best way to make sure that citizens are on board is to you know, put them on board from the get go and from the creation of that narrative. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, then I would like to invite uh, Mr. Stefan Vergote to share his ideas and please, for the sake of time, try to stick to the five minutes uh, reflections. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> I'll try that. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, very interesting event that actually comes at a very um, important moment in time for the Green Deal as we are moving from proposals uh, to accelerate the, the clean energy transition uh, towards actually uh, coming to real uh, uh, adopted um, legislation that will need to accelerate, if you look at uh, the presentations of the previous speakers, will have to accelerate quite fast the emission reductions in Europe in order to be consistent with what science is telling us. So let me give me a, a few hints on, on what this narrative can, can be all about. I think the first thing is that um, it's very important that the science is behind it. Um, we find this natural in this field, but it's not always natural because in many other policy fields, uh, or I would say in climate change, it's really the science that is driving uh, the action. And um, we need to continue to, it, to do that. So what the researchers are doing on climate science is extremely important. And it's also very important that we continue to do that. If I can give an example, it was European researchers on climate scientists and uh, people working on integrated assessment modeling that continue to work on scenarios for two degrees, one and a half degrees, 10, 15 years ago. And that fed into the IPCC reports, and that fed into the policy making uh, and the discussions at international, at international level. So we need to continue doing that, and we need to have our narrative fully based on science. Secondly, it needs to be global. It's very important and very interesting to see that it's perhaps only a starting point because um, uh, it's, it's long term, but many regions in the world are now talking about climate neutrality 2050, China talking about 2060, but to have that common understanding, not only in, in, in 
I would say, abstract terms of uh, two degrees, but what that means concretely for when you are going to decarbonize your economy and when you are becoming to become climate neutral is important. Um, about the economic uh, narrative, it is true that the transformation we are facing is, is very large. Um, and in that context, uh, it will not always be easy and it's not an only a rosy picture. Uh, and we need to acknowledge that and that also translates into a, uh, social aspects that we need to address, which I think in the Fit for 55 have become much more to the forefront as well. But, it also, but there are also challenges that we are facing today that we can solve. Uh, like, for instance, as we are talking now about uh, the increasing energy prices, if we would have decarbonized faster, our vulnerability to such an economic shock would have been much lower. So it is a story about being clear about where we can, uh, uh, where this action can help our economy to solve our economic problems, but also be clear about that this does not come, uh, this comes with a major investment challenge. <clears throat> and of course, uh, let me come to the fourth point on innovation, which is crucially important, of course, in the field of climate change, because we know that many solutions are still not sufficient in terms of costs, in terms of performance, in terms of convenience. They all need to get much better in order to, and especially in the how to decarbonize sectors, in order <clears throat> to make this transition as, as um, cheap and as cost effective and as uh, fast as possible. Um, <clears throat> on that, I really think we need organizations like ERA. Uh, I think Rosalinda already mentioned the aspect of impact. We, we, can do far, we, we still can do better in terms of organizing. We don't have huge amount of money in Horizon Europe. We can still do better, I think, by working together. And the co-creation that has been put forward now in, the, in Horizon Europe is a real opportunity to do that. Uh, we have done that ourselves by, for instance, in Cluster 5, uh, putting climate, energy, and transport together. So inside the Commission, we are now talking <clears throat> much more uh, uh, or working much more closely together to develop those programs. And we need you on that as well, on what do we really need to do to, to make the impact maximum. We also need, and in Europe we are not good enough at it, it's not only about research and innovation, it's about bringing it to market. And I think in Horizon Europe as well, we see innovations on that side, with, for instance, with the European Innovation Council. On our side, in DigiClima, we have the innovation funds. Where we, that is really trying to tackle this bridge between the research and innovation results that, that's happening in the lab to bring that really to market, to upscale clean tech, which is a very difficult part of the whole exercise. And people talk uh, a lot about the value of death. That is exactly what we're trying to address, address there. So ideas about how Europe can better bring things to market is extremely important. And a final point on, on the research in, in, in the entire society. Um, there, it is true, we have, uh, technology is not developed on its own, in its own little corner. It, it needs to be, it will have to be implemented in the real world. And there are many issues that need to ta be taken into account. The social aspect, the regulatory aspects, the public acceptance aspects, uh, other environmental aspects, <coughs> potential trade-offs. Uh, material aspects, it is really important that early on, because we will have to implement fast, that early on all these issues are, are detected. And I think we need to do that, we need to bring those aspects in the research projects, in the topics, rather than something that we do on top, uh, we have uh, additional program on, 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 on these aspects. No, it needs to be brought closer to the technology because the things have to, have to work together, and we need to understand those issues as we will have to implement them. So, um, a number of ideas, but uh, very much look forward, forward to the further discussion. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. For also this very clear appeal to our role as a research institute. And then, uh, finally, I would like to invite uh, Monique Hoyas, director of uh, the consumer organization, to bring in the consumer perspective. Uh, very happy to be um, 
able to uh, share the consumer perspective, you know, those people you are talking about since nine o'clock this morning. Um, so we are, I mean, I'm leading here the Secretariat, but we have members in all European countries. They have daily contacts with thousands of consumers. And I can tell you, energy is high on the agenda for the moment. Huh? So a lot of uh, uh, visits or consultations are about the energy bills. Uh, this being said, um, Everybody agrees that the, the, the energy transition needs to be fair and just, but there is a little bit less convergence when it what is fair and what is just. And just would like to react on to two things. We have spoken this morning, and I heard Major close uh, about education. Um, well. What I would, nobody is against education, but don't throw your budgets at education if it's about the energy shift, because you need a systemic change. If you put the responsibility of this change by educating the people who have to change, you will lose. You have to, if you want systemic change to happen, you need to change the offer, not the people. Very important. Of course, we are part of the solution. We need to change our attitude, but there is lot, much more that needs to be done uh, up, up, upward. Also, education takes a generation. Huh? So that I means we are in an emergency situation. Education is always good to take, but don't concentrate, don't focus on that. By the way, we speak about narrative. Very important to be aware that you cannot really lose a lot of time developing a nice narrative because we have to act now. We don't have a lot of time to waste. It's today that people have to put their solar panels on their roof. It's today that they need to shift to an electric vehicle. So it's very important that uh, we are aware of the sense of emergency. Now, there is good news. From the consumer perspective, if the energy transition is well designed, it is an opportunity for people, included for the people who are, let's say, less affluent and low income, because those people are the ones who pay most in uh, part of their budget to energy. The energy bill, badly insulated houses, it's, it's a disaster for those people. So in having higher efficiency in their buildings, for example, uh, making uh, energy efficient products more available for them, you get them out of poverty because the energy bill is less burdening their household budget. So that's very important. So it's a climate necessity and the narrative can be, it's an opportunity for all to be better off at the end of the day. But it won't be uh, an easy travel. It won't be a smooth uh, journey. And um, what I first would like to say uh, is, it's, there has been quite some fake news uh, with the spike in energy prices. Huh? There have been some pseudo or almost criminals saying that this is due to the energy transition. Of course, it is not true. I mean, this should be really uh, in court. Uh, because, it, as you said, it's because we are too slow in transiting that we have this problem. We are depending on volatile market uh, functionings and um, dysfunctioning markets. So that's very important to really stress towards people that energy transition is the solution to energy prices rather than a problem. Now, uh, coming back to the difficulties f for consumers, is of course, an, uh, it will not be easy and they will need to make a lot of investments or they will need to go through a lot of steps before they can really uh, consider themselves to have been transited <laughs> in their lifestyles. Uh, it is not only financial. Uh, it is also about uh, difficult. I mean, I consider myself to be quite an educated consumer. I really struggle to get a good system of heating in my house, really. Who can I trust? What information can I trust? What system is the best? Uh, what uh, fa funding uh, opportunity should I use? So there is not in, there is a lot of information out there, a lot of noise, as you said, but is there really good information and good support? People need funding and they need uh, trustworthy advice and support. We at Berk, we ask for a one-stop shop to uh, really accompany consumers into their um, transition, if I can say so. Um, and of course, the sustainable option must be the most, uh, must be available to start with, must be affordable, must be attractive, make it fun, and must be convenient for people. For policymakers, this means, and I, I will, always, I mean, I try to respect my time, I will not say everything I wanted to say, can you imagine? Um, so uh, for policymakers, first thing, uh, so you won't have the people coming to you, you have to come to the people. Bring the, e the good technologies to the people. Don't make them invest in technologies that will be, uh, that will be in fact lost. Uh, for example, when it comes to heating and cooling, what we see is that it's the heat pumps and district heating will be the solutions for domestic heating or cooling uh, in the future. Don't make people invest in gas and hydrogen. Hydrogen, I know it's a very debated thing. There is a lot of lobbying going on uh, on hydrogen. Hydrogen is part of the energy mix, but not for household consumption. 
very important message. Uh, and don't push people there because they will, uh, they will in fact not only lose money, but maybe even have to replace their investment. We have, a, we have a study coming up there. Uh, it's almost finalized, a total cost of ownership of different heating devices for people. Uh, and as with electric cars, we see that really the electric solutions are, are the ones that are the, the, the most, um, I mean, uh, also economically uh, viable for consumers. Last point I wanted to make, and it's a no brainer, and I have to, I repeat this since like 10 years, more investment in energy efficiency. I mean, retrofitting of buildings. I mean, this is the hugest potential uh, of, of energy saving and of reduction of CO2 emissions. If you go for the building stock, and there, of course, you cannot, it must be really a policy, like uh, I think Mayor Klaus spoke about social housing retrofitting, public building and retrofitting, but also helping the middle class of consumers to retrofit their houses. That would be certainly something that, uh, that will be a, a major, uh, let's say, fact driver of uh, reduction of CO2 emissions. And um, then also, uh, a last point I wanted to make, uh, we have the demand response, flexibility of consumption is one of the solutions to get the, the energy consumption under control and to, peak, uh, to, sh uh, to shave the peaks, energy demand peaks. The clean energy package made that possible. However, member states have not implemented it, most of them. First of all, member states have not implemented the consumer pro provisions there. And second, the market doesn't offer. There are not a lot of contracts that are easy to understand for consumers. Very, you, you need to be a geek huh? to understand how you uh, play demand response. Uh, so this is not a mainstream offer on the market. Uh, and if where it is, it's very, we, we for the moment see a lot of unfair contract terms in the contracts that are being offered there in terms of uh, they share your data with somebody who should not get those data. Uh, the, the pricing is not necessarily clearly indicated. So a lot has to be done if you want to have the people on board and it's beyond the narrative for sure. You need to really to act. Thank you. Okay, thank you for this uh, very clear uh, message as well. So I, I think we already had a very rich uh, input on the table uh, to be discussed. Uh, we have little time, but um, I would like to ask Nils to give a first reflection. And I think the first um, one of the main uh, topics that came on the table was the fact that the um, narrative and transition should be beautiful, as stated uh, in, in a mission like the European Bauhaus, but also it will become a bit messy. That's what we have been talking about as well. How can it be both together? How can we combine it in, in, and ensure that it comes together? So um, I'm listening to the panelists here, and there's a lot of things to bring home. And I must say that the latest, last, spe last speaker, uh, Monique, uh, there's a lot of stuff I would like to say as well, you know, it's, it's I, I agree to a lot of the consumer views that she uh, she is uh, bringing forward here. And and I think the, the key here is, is really the discourse between the stated policies uh, and how we're going to achieve it. And you could say that many of the consumers are more or less lured into this kind of situation. I could take an example from, from my own country, there's just been a general election. And all the parties say that they have policies, policies which can support the, uh, uh, the determ determined contribution from Norway, which is 55, 50 to 55% by 2030. However, you must still be able and it must be possible to drive your diesel car. You must be able to, to eat whatever you want. You must be able to travel wherever you want and so forth. And that is, in my view, it's, it's uh, fooling people uh, because this uh, 50 to 55% by 2030, which have shown, been shown by, by Professor van Uypersel and so forth, is going to be a huge effort and also from, from, uh, from uh, our SEC general. And, and I think people need to understand that there are big changes and one of the most powerful uh, tools in the, new, in, in the new budget for 21 uh, 22, sorry, is really to increase the gas price by four euro cents, which causes a lot of discussions. You know, they want to, don't want to have this, although the pump price changes much more than that during during the year. But that's that's clear. We need to take some uh, decisions here. We need to have a different mindset, and I think in terms of the narrative or the clean energy transition. Um, and how we develop uh, this, it really has to show that, well, we're actually building a much better world by these actions. 
and it was uh, alluded to by the, the first speaker here, Lambert, uh, about we are reluctant for change. Yes, but we're in for change here, but it's, it's a change for the better. And I liked the the power plan of Obama some years ago, which talked about this narrative about we're actually developing a, a much better world than the one we are uh, on track to, to do uh, now. And I would like also to add then the, uh, um, the report we are releasing today, if you pick up that report, it's coming from the European Energy Research Alliance. I mean, you would think, well, this is full of research topics. You need to do, you know, active control of uh, offshore floating wind turbines. You need to do new materials. You need to do that and that and that. You won't find that. It's actually building on this narrative and then on the transitions and the challenges which is very much along the missions of, uh, of uh, the thinking of the, of the Commission. And then we leave it to our joint programs then to come up with what are the key items to underpin this development. And the discourse here, of course, um, is the, uh, the difference between the stated policies and what is actually put into the, the, the field. And people must understand and they must see that this is uh, investment to do for, for a better uh, society. And um, as was alluded to by several of the speakers here, uh, IA states uh, a factor of four in the increase in the research and innovation actions. Bill Gates, he is on the uh, number of five, you know, in terms of accelerating. And I'm really curious to see what will come out of the COP26, being so many menus serves to the, serve to the world leaders but how we can actually achieve these targets and to keep the one and a half degree alive. Um, I think the topic of hey, what you also say, um, technology should be there, but it should be accepted, it should be human, as was uh, also stated by some of the panelists. Would uh, some of the panelists would like to um, shed their light on what is human technological progress and what isn't? Yes, mister? Yep. Yeah. So um, when I was reading the Horizon 2020 uh, calls for five, five years ago, uh, so I'm a social scientist by training, so that's my bias. Um, and so I had the impression, for instance, I don't know, on onshore winds that, you know, the guys, uh, mostly the guys actually, would de be developing a, a new onshore wind or offshore wind technology uh, for, you know, two years and a half. And during the last six months of the project, we would worry, start worrying about the citizens. Uh, and asking us social scientists to, to come up with a solution that will, you know, allow them to accept. Um, and maybe because I'm a Frenchman, but uh, when I hear, you know, the acceptance, uh, I think of the goose uh, that is accepting to be fed in order to produce foie gras. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. So, technically speaking, that, uh, that is acceptance. That's absolutely not what I think we should aim for. So, let's reverse that. Let's not have the social scientists come up at the very end of the project once the technology is already there. Have them work from the get-go, understanding what's the situation, what's the territory. Is there, for instance, a strong regional identity on which we could tap to say that, you know, uh, to build a narrative about regional autonomy from an energy perspective? And that's a very powerful message in many, many, many regions uh, in, uh, in Europe. And then let's understand what are the fears of the people. Whether they're legitimate or not is a secondary matter, but let's understand what are their fears, what are their hopes, and from that, Let's build the technology that will be a good fit for this kind of population in this specific territory. Thank you. Ms. Igoyes, you wanted to comment on that? Yeah, I just want to confirm that we are uh, very often contacted by people who are preparing a project for Horizon or for Life or, uh, and who one week before the deadline ask us whether we want to be on their advisory committee. <laughs> so it is just, oh, they realize that, yes, they, they would have an, an additional point uh, in, the, in the evaluation because they have consumers on board. This is not the right way to be inclusive. Okay, thank you. Which brings us, I think, to the topic of uh, what has been called co-creation. Um, and much has been said about these um, narratives, as also missions need to be um, established in a co-creative process. Um, as uh, some last advice for us as researchers, how should we involve uh, citizens in our co-creative process in our research? Maybe, Rosalinda, you have some ideas on that. 
No, absolutely. Well, I think the starting point is, of course, that we need much more than before to connect the dots between the local, regional, national, European and even global level. Uh, I think we are in this transition all together. So I think it is absolutely crucial. And of course, I mean, we started when we were preparing these missions, we started to organize co-creation events from Brussels. But of course, it clearly has the limitations. I mean, uh, so that's why, I mean, I think for a successful implementation, um, of co-creation events, we need to make sure that these are organized at different levels and in particular also at the local levels. And that's why I think, you know, the strength of organizations like ERA is, you know, that you, are rep you have representations, uh, you know, in, in many different uh, areas of the European Union. And I think this is the way. And it also links back to the idea that we need to have also these coherent messages. So I think if we can connect the dots, all work together. And I think the most important thing is that we start locally and that we have a consistent process uh, up to uh, the European Union level. If I also may, because I'm really triggered by the, the, the comment made by the previous speaker, I remember when we were negotiating the Horizon Europe program, there was a very strong SSH movement that said, you know, we need to preserve uh, SSH and it's extremely important. And there the approach at least that we want for Horizon Europe, which is a change from the past, is that we mainstream uh, the social dimension across the program into the projects. So at least that is the design of the program. And I certainly hope that it will work uh, better uh, when it comes to the implementation uh, of Horizon Europe. If it doesn't, uh, we will make also an interim evaluation of the program because I, I thank you for sharing your feedback also on what's happened under Horizon 2020. I think this is a crucial aspect. We need to have this integrated approach. We need to include the social dimension, the consumer dimension, the citizen dimension from the beginning now. Uh, this is what was the intention from Horizon Europe. Um, so I really also would like to invite all of you uh, to provide the feedback uh, whether this now is actually working and a big change from, uh, from the previous program. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe a last word uh, for Mr. Vergote. Um, you uh, appealed us for to having science-based narrative and to bring science into not only technology but also the narrative in order to create impact. Can you have, do you have some examples on which science is not yet there and should be part of the narrative? I think. Yes, it will work. I think. Just okay. go ahead. Um, I'm not an expert in climate science, but um, the, um, what I read from it, I still think that when it comes to understanding the impacts of climate change, um, what it means um, in temporal and in geographic terms, exactly four different scenarios, um, is, is really helpful in terms of understanding um, what the difference is between the different, what the difference is between uh, the high impact scenarios and uh, and uh, scenarios, for instance, related to 1.5 degrees. But it's also, and that's really a very difficult thing. And um, it's also about how do we do communication on climate science because um, these are, of course, very complex problems that. Uh, or global, uh, go from the global level to what happens in my, my own region, that are about uh, what happens in the next five years and what happens in 100 or 200 years. And how to communicate that kind of, uh, uh, that to the general public is, is extremely important. And it's extremely important in a democratic society because in the end, in a democratic society, it is uh, the democratic institutions that decide. And the democratic institutions are elected by the people. And I think one of the things we have seen in Europe in the last 20 years is that essentially um, there is largely a consensus, perhaps not a consensus, but at least a large majority is understanding and accepting the basic science. That is not so everywhere in the world. Uh, we take it for granted, but it is certainly not, and it shouldn't be taken for granted also by definition for the future. So that, that aspect uh, in a democratic society is, is very important. Thank you. Then I would like to invite Nils for a last reflection because I think we are getting uh, short in time and not to disturb the whole agenda of today. Nils. Um, yeah. uh, 
I, I just want to bring some more complication into okay. the issue. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking about the clean energy transition. And in my opening speech, I was also talking about the, you know, the, is the climate crisis, but there is also the biodiversity and, and land use uh, crisis. And that really has to be an integrated approach. Um, and, and that's something I'm, I'm really looking forward to what will happen in, the, in Glasgow uh, in terms of trying to merge these two different crises. Then you would get a double crisis. No, I don't think so. You need to integrate that in all the thinking because uh, uh, what is driving what is very, very much linked these two things. And at least uh, from the RTO's point of view, this is a new uh, driver. You could say it's an old driver because it's about environmental protection, which is an old one and was driving a lot of research uh, uh, earlier on. But then the cli climate crisis kind of taken over. But now we need to merge these. And I think we need to get the nature researchers. They need to talk to the technologists, you know, and the researchers in that space. And it doesn't happen much. So I would also very much encourage that the uh, research programs also uh, ask for this kind of reflections and how can these technology be, de be deployed or uh, have an impact which respects both uh, climate and nature and I know they are interrelated. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe we should not forget uh, we have one panelist online still, uh, the limitations of hybrid uh, formats. Uh, uh, Mr. Lambert, uh, it was also uh, Mr. Rigotte talked about democracy. Of course, you are representing the people in the European Parliament um, and you started your intervention with people uh, feel screwed. Um, can you react on um, the communication and how we should do communication towards all citizens in order to tackle this problem? Well, I can uh, only expand off on what I said before. Uh, uh, someone just said that the general acceptance uh, that we have an existential challenge with uh, the environmental limitations we live in is, uh, is there. So I think most of our people understand that something serious need to be, needs to be done. By the way, I, I met quite a few yellow jackets uh, uh, during their revolt. In, uh, in France uh, three years ago, and most of the people I met, of course, it's not a representative uh, sample, agreed that indeed something needed to be done. So th there's no question there. But then again, it is not a matter of discourse. Uh, as uh, sorry, I forgot your name uh, from the Jacques Delors Foundation. I totally agree with uh, with what was said. Uh, it's about reducing inequality. It's not just leaving more people behind. It's bringing people back into the fold. And no amount of discourse will will succeed. We are beyond that. I mean, the level of anger and distrust in our society is such that only concrete acts will restore trust. Look, look at one example. It, it's just a parallel. I mean, the distrust in Italy about the European institutions was actually uh, the majority. I mean, the majority of Italians previously were pro-Europeans and then a majority became anti-European. Up until, up until the recovery fund, the European recovery fund, making Italy the biggest beneficiary, was adopted, right? And that shifted public opinion back in favor of Europe, because this is a concrete decision. So no, it is not a, a question of narrative. It is not a question of promises, of explanations, of discourse. It is a matter of action. We know that indeed we have an existing challenge with, uh, with the planetary boundaries and we have an existing challenge with inequality in our society. People know that. It's not a matter of further analysis or further explanation. It is a matter of concretely changing policies. And there I would disagree with the fact that we have to convince Bill Gates. I'm sorry about that. He's part of the problem. He may become part of the solution, but that means that his privatization of public action must end. We must decide rules that, we, that will actually constrain Bill Gates. And if you want to compromise with him, this will lead you to actually solve often regulation when it needs to become harder. No, if we do the right thing, the likes of Bill Gates, of Jamie Dimon, of even Patrick Pouyanné, I'm sorry to say, they won't like it. And they don't need to like it. Sorry about this. Because if 
if we need to make the changes to make them like it, we will not solve the problem. And I prefer solving the problem than pleasing those guys. Uh, there may be also questions from the audience. Yes, um, please introduce yourself shortly and to whom you would like to address the question. Yeah. So if it, if it... This is not a, a question. My name is Mahbubeh Hurtamani from BAM Consulting. Um, well, actually, when I'm listening to all of you, I see that your mindset focused in the uh, pu public and in the industry in the euro. I mean, you're time to time talking about the global and international collaboration. But the point is that when we go through this hard transition, we have all this pain and we do our best. What happened in the rest of the world that they're responsible for ma major actually publication uh, uh, pollution? What happened if, uh, for example, in the uh, countries that are not as democratic as European or countries that are very profit oriented decided to have a politician that like Donald Trump say, I do not believe what you say. I mean, all effort that we go through actually would, would, would be wasted. Uh, what is your plan to bring those people in the board and to get the support for them? Because we as a European alone cannot uh, cover these issues. We can do our best, but how, what is our plan? I mean, what should be thinking or, or what, how we should bring them into the board to support us? That is the question as well. Okay, Mrs. Goyes, you want to? I think this is a very important point. Of course, I'm, I have only a mandate to represent and to promote the interests of European consumers, so I, I cannot really do that. But what we say, and it has already been mentioned, it's the importance of consistency of European policies. So uh, if we have a strong, let's say, green deal, strategy, uh, the trade policy should be part of, the uh, of pushing that through the, to the other markets. And there we see now there has been a warming up, if I can say so, of the relationships with the United States. Uh, and there is the Trade and Tech Council that has been created, it has been set up, first meeting in Pittsburgh a few weeks ago. And uh, I think that the energy transition is part of the discussions there and the, certainly the technological solutions and how to work together. And we are part of the stakeholder group that is watching there and uh, the, the TTC as they call it now. Uh, and we will certainly bring the energy questions together with our American colleagues uh, on the table whenever we have the solution. Thank you, Mr. Rigote. Well, yes, I think the, our first answer should of, of course first uh, should be we lead by example and we do what we preach. So if we um, in the past at the international arena have done uh, the first Kyoto Protocol and then the 2020 package and now the 2030 package, we deliver on what we, pre on what we say and we implement it. That is extremely important. And the first slide when I'm for an audience speaking, the first time slide I always show is a slide where we have reduced since 1990 our greenhouse gas emissions by 25% and our economy has grown by about 50%. And that's mostly a message towards uh, developing countries, where the first pre preoccupation is, of course, how can we make our people more wealthy? So it is possible. In Europe, we do it since 30 years. And of course, it is not fast enough, enough at all. But we are reducing emissions while uh, uh, preserving a an, uh, an healthy economy. The second thing is, of course, we need to work internationally. And there, the, co the international negotiations remain extremely important. Um, we will hope, of course, that in the COP26 we will see not only the further announcements on where do we want to be in 2050 on 2060, but indeed where do I want to be in 2025 and 2030, because it was shown on the slides that uh, in order to be there in 2050, we need to act now. Global e greenhouse gas emissions need to be reduced now. Uh, and that increasing trend has to, has to be curbed now. And also in Europe, with the economic recovery and the RFF, we do have an option to ac actually accelerate the investments in, in, in that area. Um, so those are the two strands. Um, in terms of the research community, what I also, having worked 20 years on climate and energy, it's very interesting that in, in, in climate, research people were global. In energy, it's totally, it's, it's quite different. And I do think when you talk about the narrative and, and how do we need to try make this global uh, clean energy transition, that 
international collaboration also on the energy side uh, should become stronger. So we, I think we need to think about that, how that can be organized. In the end, it's a global energy problem that we are tackling. And I don't really see really big, big, big global collaboration on energy. Okay, thank you. I think this is a perfect bridge to the second uh, panel after the coffee break um, on international cooperation. So unless there are any burning questions left, I would like to thank all panelists for the rich um, in interventions and food for thought we can take home in our further research um, and narrative to be developed. Um, thank you very much. And uh, the coffee break is uh, waiting for all of you. Thank you.
to uh, look at him. Okay, yeah, you know. Can I please kindly ask you? Can I please ask you to take back your seat because we're going to start now? Could I please ask you to take your seat? Thank you very much. Thank you. So, shall we start uh, or oh, reconvene? So, thank you again for your presence. I hope you are enjoying the discussion as much as I am. So, we have, uh, we'll continue to discuss solutions to solve our don uh, daunting challenges. And uh, as you've had the chance to see in the area white paper, uh, presented today, you can find uh, higher level recommendations as already presented by Adele. One of those recommendations to policymakers is this uh, part in chapter, accelerating the innovation cycle and increase international collaboration. So, um, it is, uh, and in the, these two points, it is referred to increase the collaboration by the creation of centers of excellence towards a strong, stronger collaboration between research, research facilities and industry, and also strategically increase international collaborations. Also, as very well put questions in the first panel, also with other parts of the world besides Europe. Uh, if we want to lead by example, we need to work with those that need uh, our example. So, um, but uh, these uh, centers of excellence and international collaboration has an ambiguous meaning. And uh, today we have uh, with us this high level panel to help us to disambiguous the feeling uh, of this definition and uh, help us to leverage efforts to build the centers of excellence that we really, uh, really present a value proposition um, for our uh, energy transition. So without further ado, I, we have with us, I hope we have Ellen Cray. I'm not seeing. Yeah. But should be there. Yes. So, thank I you, am. thank you, Helen, Helen Cray, which is, she is the head of unit of clean energy transition from RTD, and uh, um, uh, we say we have also Benson Beruto, head of unit of uh, uh, innovation DGNR, uh, Peter Essen which is one of our joint program uh, coordinators at ERA. He is the, the uh, coordinator of WING joint program. Laurence de Vries, also joint uh, program coordinator, energy systems integration. We have Adele El Gamal, our secretary general at ERA, and Asgain uh, Tomagard, director at uh, NTNU Energy Technology Initiative. So I hope you, um, uh, you can help us with this uh, uh, difficult and ambiguous discussion. So uh, I ask you to take uh, five minutes for a first uh, address. So, Ellen, do you want to start, please? Ladies first. 
Yeah. Yes. I see. <laughs> uh, I, I feel I am the only one uh, in that list, except with you, uh, dear, dear chair. So somehow we need to improve that. I'm sorry, but I have a mandate from my director general about this type of uh, gender balance. Uh, right. Having uh, done my duty now, <laughs> I see also that there is a kind of uh, decalage between uh, the screen and what I say. So sorry for that and sorry to be in remote, but it was very complicated for today. Uh, I just left the uh, ERA uh, discussion from the task force on hydrogen. So uh, the address will be reasonably short. I understand you are also running out of time. Um, the um, we, we have a few priorities in the DG, in DG research and innovation. Uh, one of our priorities is, of course, the climate on, on the objectives and the Green Deal. Research and innovation should support the Green Deal. And uh, we have a, a, a substantial part of our Horizon Europe work program, or program in general, which is devoted now to climate. But more of that, we have another let's say more, not political, but um, structural priority, which is to reinforce co cooperation with the uh, important actors. And this on one hand is the member states, and on the other hand, uh, the industry and the stakeholders. And by the way, this is, you are at the crossing of both. So this reinforces the role of ERA. Um, we have that, in that line, we have developed the ERA, the need to make a difference between e ERA and ERA, uh, the European Research Area, and there will be a substantial part on innovation on that. Uh, the centers of excellence are just one part of uh, what is uh, ongoing. Uh, the ID, uh, one of the uh, important thing of the European Research Area is to uh, strengthen the innovation system the ecosystem for knowledge um, circulation and valorization. So uh, European research area has a little bit uh, few pillars approach. One pillar is indeed these cross-cutting uh, things on innovation, for instance, on valorization of knowledge. Another one is to have some um, uh, pilots and the pilot on hydrogen is one. It's the first time we have a thematic pilot on ERA. And uh, a, a last point, which is very important for us, we have been developing Horizon Europe in co-creation uh, with stakeholders and with member states. This co-creation approach is extremely important. So what is important is the objective of the Green Deals and additional objectives of circularity and sustainability. What is also important is a process to develop that, which is co-creation and having a, a European area for what is important for research and innovation. I, I don't want to be long more, I mean, longer than that. This is putting the frame and I will be happy uh, to answer any question you would have. Then I would be happy also to give the floor to my colleague uh, if uh, I, I Stop. I mean, I avoided to speak on the fit for 55 because I understand that, Vincent, you will have some points on that, so I don't want to duplicate. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. So, uh, please, Vincent, can you take, take the floor? It's on. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> good morning, everyone. It's good to be here, and I'd like to thank uh, Niels and Adels for inviting me. I think the presentations this morning were extremely interesting. I, I listened with great interest with what Professor von Ipersilli uh, said, and uh, what he said, and the report from the IPCC, I mean, for me, are a clear reminder that we need to step up our efforts um, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. I think that's a clear reminder. Another clear reminder, of course, is the crisis we're in now in terms of energy prices that uh, takes a lot of our time in DG Energy. Uh, you've seen that the wholesale electricity prices uh, since uh, in the last nine months have um, increased by 200%, which has had an impact on, on the retail prices. 
and that has made the headlines everywhere in Europe and uh, in, in the world, because that's not only a phenomenon in uh, Europe, of course. And I think that tells us that um, we need to go faster in our efforts to uh, increase energy efficiency, increase the share of renewable energy sources in our energy system, and ultimately uh, decrease our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, reduce our dependency on uh, imports from uh, outside Europe, which also includes some volatility in the energy prices, and that explains as well the, uh, the crisis we're in now. Fortunately, I think we've got in place a financing framework which is unprecedented. I think Rosalind uh, from DGRTD this morning reminded us about the uh, framework program for research and innovation, Horizon Europe, I mean, and it's 95.5 billion euro. I'd like just to uh, mention as well that the multi-annual financial framework we're having at the European Union level now for the next seven years, together with the recovery instrument that has been uh, voted, we've got together 1.8 trillion euros. That's the biggest budget ever for the European Union. And there, the commitment was that we would spend at least 30% on climate-related action. So I think there's a lot of money coming. Of course, for research and innovation, it's Horizon Europe, but there are other programs like the Innovation Fund, which was mentioned by my colleague from DG Klima. We've got the LIFE program, a new clean energy transition sub-program in LIFE, that's for the very first time, aiming at deployment of clean energy technologies. So I think we have to use that. And on top of that, we've got the recovery and resilience facility, which is, uh, again, uh, an incredible budget there and uh, an obligation for member states to use at least 37% of that budget for climate-related actions. And in practice, when, when you look into the plans of member states, you see that they are aiming at spending more than 37%. So in DG Energy, we've looked at uh, the 22 plans uh, that uh, we uh, so far commission adopted. And if you add up all the budget that goes to climate related actions, you come to a figure of 177 billion euro. And not all is going to research and innovation. It's all more, uh, only a small fraction. We estimate it's around 12, 13% that will go to research and innovation in the Green Deal priorities. But still, that's considerable money that can also be used to trigger uh, research and innovation in member states. So I think we have to use this opportunity. It's unprecedented. And uh, this, is, this is here, and, this, and the spending goes, goes very fast. Now, we don't need only uh, spending programs. We also need uh, policies which are conducive of uh, energy um, in innovation. And, and I think we have now uh, the right framework um, to uh, stimulate uh, research and innovation in clean energy with the adoption in July of the climate law, which uh, enshrine into law the obligation of reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030 and reach climate neutrality by 2030. But we also have the, uh, the Green Deal package that was adopted in, in, in uh, July uh, with notably two very important pieces of legislation that concern energy. One is the uh, revision of the Energy Efficiency Directive where we set a new target for 2030, where we double the uh, obligations for annual energy savings, uh, where we have new um, uh, requirements to alleviate uh, energy poverty, where we enshrine into law also the energy efficiency first principle. I, mean, I think that's very important. So that set the target, set the means, and, and that will uh, drive innovation in energy efficiency. So that, that concerns the energy use, but we also have the revision of the Renewable Energy Directive, which with its, its new target of 40% uh, reduction, 40%, um, uh, sorry, of the share of renewables in primary energy consumption by 2030 with clear sub-targets per country, uh, sub-targets per uh, sectors, buildings, heating and cooling, transport industry, which is new. And I think that, that will, of course, uh, also stimulate uh, innovation on the uh, supply side. So we have to use that. Innovation is, uh, is also depending on the legal framework, and we have this legal framework in place. We're preparing by the end of the year also the revision of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive that will have an impact also on research and innovation in the building sector. We're working on a hydrogen and gas decarbonisation package which should be ready by the end of the year, which also will have uh, an effect on, on clean energy innovation. 
But in addition, and that's my last point, uh, we have funding programs, we have innovation, but we also need more collaboration uh, between uh, national uh, research and innovation programs and, and policies. And that, I think, is, uh, is, is very important. That's the subject of that panel. I mean, that's something which is extremely important. Uh, collaboration between policies, programs, but also how we can exchange best practice on how to leverage uh, private investment in research and innovation. Because let's, let's not forget that the, uh, we invest in Europe about 25 billion euro uh, every year in clean energy research and innovation, and more than 80% of it is private investment. So we have to use public money to leverage this. And I think there's also scope of collaboration uh, between member states on how to do this in the most effective way, using the tools that we have, namely the programs and the uh, legal instruments. But that's all what we are going to discuss about, so I'm very looking forward to that discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vassem, for, for your points. So we have a huge amount of money, we have organization, but we need to, to understand better how to cooperate within ourselves for Europe and for the world, I think. I think we will come back to this, to this point. So at this time, I would uh, move to Peter. Yeah. And um, okay, please uh, uh, tell us a little bit about how to this ambiguous, the ambiguous, uh, uh, definition targets. of yeah. the centers of excellence. So, th thank you for for uh, for inviting me here. So, when we when we listened this morning to what is needed for climate change, one thing is certain that renewables in Europe are going to be massive, and they need to be massive. So, any investment in those is is worthwhile. I would say. So, it's no, it's a no regret option to to do wind energy or solar energy or any renewable energy research. And um, within the joint program, we are working with, with 50 institutes in Europe, RTOs and universities who are independent. So we really can set the direction what we, we, we need to do. And, uh, and we work quite closely together with industry, with e wind which is a different organization with its own roadmap. But the roadmaps, yeah, so what are the challenges and what are the, the, the challenges or the challenges and the priorities that need to be addressed? What, what are those? Those are quite aligned, I would say, between ERA and, uh, and the, the industry, ETPINT. But the time frames are, are somewhat different. So we, we have to accelerate. And at the moment, Europe is number one in wind energy. And we would like to remain number one in wind energy. And that is not something that is a given. It is something that we need to, to work on. And, uh, and now I come to the, the, the concept of center of excellence, because center of excellence we see in, in different scales. Eh? So, for example, in the Netherlands, we have an, a, a collaboration between research and industry, uh, but also in regional uh, levels. On the European scale, it is not yet so much there. And I think that is the question. So how should we proceed? And if I look back to the discussion of this morning, there was the notion that um, the social aspects and uh, the social inclusion of innovations need to be addressed in the projects. And I would say projects are really too small for that. I was a reviewer in a call, a Dutch call, where there needed to be a social innovation and a technical innovation in one project of a few million, and it kills all good ideas, both for the social sciences as for the, the technical science. And I would say this is a typical topic that should be addressed on a center of excellence level, where, where you have the think tank, the priority settings, the collaboration with industry, uh, setting the priorities, also understanding what is the, the social aspect, so you can drive the social innovations to, to, drive, to understand what is the implication of what you have found in order to drive your technical innovations, and then still from the center of excellence also drive your purely technical, purely social uh, projects. And I think that would be would call for a very large collaboration. And my question to also the audience and to the other panelists is, should we do that on more regional level? Because we see that in the regions, eh, for example, North Sea regions, you have different priorities than, for example, Mediterranean or uh, Western Europe versus Eastern Europe. Um, I have not, not the answer. I see that collaboration on an international scale is really important. 
which is yet the, pre the, the precursor for the, let's say, the pan, uh, pan continental scale. Huh? So how to also drive the things in Africa or in Asia, whatever. And with that, um, yeah, so the, the notion is, I think that the center of excellence where which, which needs to be something permanent. It's not something that you do for three years and then it is it's solved. It needs to be a collaboration between industry and uh, academia, where the independence of the academia should be crucial. Because what you see very often is that large industrial parties have a short time frame and much different uh, goals than we need for climate change. And uh, we have to go for shared use of our thinkers, yeah, so the, 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 the experts, and the shared use of our excellent research infrastructure that we have built up in Europe. And with that, I would like to close. Thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, we really, we also already have the seats for the centers of excellence. Maybe we should think about how to deliver in a very uh, clear way uh, how to deliver to the sustainable development goals. Uh, in a clear and measurable way, but uh, uh, without this uh, uh, idea in the in the air, I pass the word to to Lorenz uh, De Vries, and uh, I would like you to, to keep it to your five minutes. I think we are keeping mo mo mostly <laughs> five minutes, and uh, you tell us your your first comments on these topics. Okay, I'll. Um well, as a JP of the Energy System Integration Program, I'll, I'll give my perspective on, on the need for an uh, ECOE. Um, in, in my view, we're now moving into the second phase of, of the uh, energy transition. The first phase was the, the build out of renewable energy. Uh, it took us a long time, but now we know how to develop mainly solar and wind um, on a large scale, at industrial scale, uh, at low cost. We still have to do a lot more, but we essentially know how to do that. And we're now bumping into the question of how to integrate that. How to, on the one hand, that means dealing with a mismatch between solar and wind output and energy consumption. On the other hand, um, the, the transition so far has mainly focused on electricity because renewable energy tends to produce electricity. But the majority of energy consumption is not in electricity, it's in fossil fuels. So the next phase, we need to look at how to decarbonize these fossil fuel sectors, transport, industry, space, heating and cooling, etc. And while a geothermal energy has, has a role, they're, they're, the, probably the bulk of that will have to come from either electrification or a shift to hydrogen. But if hydrogen is green, it's also produced from electricity. So these two options come together on the upstream and again on the energy production side. This is why we need to think about energy system integration. Um, when, when people make uh, proposals, for, for instance, for an electrolyzer, they need to understand the business case for this electrolyzer in, let's say, 2030. And that means they need to have a view on um, the availability of energy, uh, electricity prices, but also uh, hydrogen prices. That means they need to understand um, how much of the industry is going to shift to hydrogen versus uh, electrification. Uh, network operators need to understand um, for the industry that shifts towards electricity, how much will be that and will, be, will they be flexible? And if they're flexible, they may move along with the supply of wind and solar. That may create network peaks. So you see all these, all these elements come together. And this is not only about industry. About half the value chain is in the grid. And the grids are either public or private, but they're regulated monopolies. Uh, and as such, quite, they behave in a very different way from, from market parties. Now, we have a fantastic set of tools to analyze the energy sector, except that, like the generals who are prepared for the previous war, our set of tools is mainly geared towards liberalization type of questions, competition issues, market power issues. A lot of our tools, both in academia and in, in, in the industry, um, were basically started 10 or even 20 years ago. Of course, they've been updated, they've been expanded, but they're not suited towards system integration questions, dealing across, uh, let's say, across border questions, uh, across sectoral questions, hydrogen integration, uh, dealing with long-term transition questions, and also with short-term weather uncertainty. So in the energy system integration program, one of our priorities is to build the next generation of tools. 
Now that will not happen overnight, so at the same time we will also have to make do with, with the tools that we have. But this is one of the big things that we're working on. Now at the same time, um, we, we, need to, we need to make decisions. There are questions now. What, what should we invest in? Should we invest in, in uh, hydrolyzers now or not? Should we start converting our gas network to hydrogen? These, these types of questions. What about uh, building out a North Sea uh, wind energy system? These are, these are more, often they're more applied questions. And right now there's a bit of a gap, I think, between, the, let's say, the fundamental energy system research uh, and, and, and these more applied questions. And that's why I think an energy, uh, a European center of excellence could come in, is to, to make, let's say, a more fluid movement of knowledge up the TRL level. Uh, the, so so from, from fundamental to applied research to either policy or industry relevant results. Um, and I emphasize here that it's not only, uh, let's say, market results, it's also about policy. Energy system integration is very much about uh, designing uh, the, the right kinds of network tariffs, network regulation, about market design. It's uh, Adele's example from the IAEA uh, that 40% that of reductions could be achieved with good market design. Yes, but we need to improve the market design, the constellation of market design, policy, taxes, network regulation. And what about the other 60%? Which policies will be most effective? What are risks? We ha don't have enough of that research. Um, but I think an energy uh, or a, a center of excellence could help us um, because I, I, we have a lot of knowledge I also see from, for instance, European funded projects that just sits there. It sits in, 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 um, in, in articles and it's not applied. Um, and I think either without or with a center of excellence era can and should play a role in, in smoothening the, the communication between the researchers, the fundamental research, the applied researchers, and, and the policy makers. I think that would be one major goal for uh, a center of excellence. Thank you, Lawrence. When take out, we can uh, um, see from your presentation is that really we need to reflect on regulation so that uh, we can cope with the, um, the challenges we, we have uh, that are very different from the past. Uh, purely based on market and liberalization. So then I pass the word to, 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 okay, to, to Asgai, Asgai. And uh, I, uh, the, the question is the same. Could you help us, lighten us, how to build uh, a good collaboration and a good centers of excellence? Thanks a lot. And um, uh, my background in ERA is from E3S, so that's Energy, Economics, Environment and Society. So it's quite multidisciplinary. I'm also heading a national center of excellence in Norway called Antrans, which is a center on energy transition strategies. And uh, I think I'll, I'll share some of the observations that we, um, that we have from, uh, from, from that center. I think one of the central questions you need to ask it's why do we need centers of excellence? And I think that is very much up to the added value that you could get out of these type of cooperation constellations. This added value could come from building increased uh, capacity to be relevant in, in terms of stakeholder dialogue due, through the research. It could come from increased capacity to do multidisciplinary research. It could come from increased capacity to do higher risk type of research with a longer horizon like uh, previous speaker said, uh, typically uh, you would need a horizon of five to eight years in order to take on those high risk efforts. And, uh, and if you look at transition strategies, that's an excellent example, I think, on, on why you would need both uh, multidisciplinarity, high risk and ensure relevance. If you look at um, energy transition, I'd, for me, it's not really about transitioning the energy system. You know more or less how we're going to transition the energy system. It's about how the energy system can transition the rest of society transport, industry, built environment. And if you look at uh, what I would call the, the main overarching challenge, which would be a deep decarbonization of society, that basically includes at the same time being my, able to see the holistic approach to addressing the built environment, transport, and, um, and industry. Uh, some examples would be hydrogen that could play a role in all of these, but also of course electrification that for sure will play a role in, in all of these. 
And I think when you look at the flexibility you need in order to succeed with this, like system integration, like Lawrence mentioned, it's, it's clear. But also if you look at uh, the interplay between technological systems and human systems, the socio-technical approach, you see that in these interfaces, to make this happen, you need the technolog technological systems to work with the human systems. And, and basically, you need to understand both what kind of possibilities are created and what kind of conflicts are created. And these conflicts are not only in the, in the human technological dimension, it's also about environmental issues and the interest of interest conflicts in terms of, for example, land use when you're building renewable facilities. And in order to succeed with this deep decommunization, you need to, to basically address this, this multi-sector approach. You have the same with acceleration. Uh, it's going far too slow. If you want to succeed with building uh, a zero emission society, you need to accelerate this. This will probably happen with an increased interplay between researchers, industry, government offices, policy makers, a number of stakeholders that would need to learn new ways to work together, both to shape policy and to implement policy and to make this happen much faster than it has done previously. It's about market, obviously. It's not only about economists sitting down and designing the new market designs. It's important to remember that consumers will play a central role in new markets and you need to facilitate processes for participation where consumers could actively participate in these markets. And it's about alternatives. So there is no one true narrative that could explain how we want to achieve the zero emission society. I think our role as, as researcher and, and research institutes is to be uh, technology neutral, open for new ideas and present alternatives. Whenever we start making very clear recommendations that this is the way to go, we are turning into politicians. We should look at the different assumptions, we should look at the different pathways that are available to us and we should say something science-based about the consequences of these choices. And then, of course, these pathways need to be developed you know, in, in cooperation with, with stakeholders and policy makers and, and uh, make the ground for the decision makers in society that will implement the pathways. Yeah. Thank you, Alkay. Um, you talked about the um, holistic approach and, uh, of course, it's, uh, what it's, uh, it's about the center of excellence and with that we should apport value to the, um, to the results and the difficulty is how to met, measure those, that value. So uh, now, uh, Adele, please keep your five minutes. Okay, thank you. I, I, will, I will be very short because for the sake of time, <clears throat> and I think a lot of interesting things uh, have been said, I just want to do, point it out the fact that we see very clearly at ERA, I can see really the very strong value of collaboration, of international collaboration. And um, I mean, it, I thought that uh, my, my colleague Peter Eason would have uh, mentioned it, but um, a few years ago there was a, a, an EC instrument which was called the uh, Integrated Research Program. And uh, this was a kind of instrument which really uh, boosted uh, what we're doing in ERA. It was, uh, it was combining <coughs> uh, CSA and, and research. Uh, and we could see we had four programs which, uh, which benefited from uh, this instrument and it's very clear that these four programs have, uh, have really made a, an enormous leap forward in terms of maturity, in terms of impact, in terms of what they, they produced and, and delivered. Um, so I think the question is, is really uh, not about what is the, the value for money of, uh, of financing collaboration. It's absolutely fundamental. Um, <clears throat> I think also um, we often completely forget, forget the, 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 the emergency. We, do, we talked about it uh, a lot of time, uh, many times today. The problem is that we, although we st start to see direct effect now, uh, climate change is still something that we project in you know, a decade or a couple of decades, uh, unlike the COVID crisis or unlike the financial crisis. But I would ju just like to remind some figures. Um, in the crisis, the financial crisis of 2008, uh, in Europe, 1,400 billions of euros were landed directly from governments to banks to save the financial system. These are official figures. Um, <clears throat> uh, the same approximately uh, more in, in the US and altogether this represented the equivalent of 150 years 
of global public spending on low carbon research. I'm talking public spending, not private spending. So it just shows that, you know, um, when there is an emergency, there is money. Uh, and we are in a climate emergency. And so my, the, the question here, in my view, is <clears throat> not necessarily to see if what is the optimal way of, uh, of using uh, uh, so many uh, this or, or this uh, uh, euro. The question is that we don't have time anymore, so we need to unite force. And centers of excellence are, in my view, uh, the ex exact projection of what we're doing with ERA, but also tightening the circle between uh, research, policy makers, governments, and industry. Because when uh, a number of member states uh, and supported with the, with the support of the Commission come together in a, and, and create a centers of excellence, this is an ideal platform for these three stakeholders to, to collaborate and in particular to research, for research to, uh, to integrate more closely with the industry, which is absolutely essential if you want to speed up um, uh, time to market. Um, maybe I will, I have other discussion points, but for the sake of time, I will, I will stop here and maybe we can open uh, the debate. Thank you, Adal. So the, we need the, uh, a strong commitment between, of course, research and the industry, but also with government member states. Um, so uh, I can, can I ask a second round? I don't know who is c controlling. The no video. <laughs> so, uh, do, do we have Ellen Cray? Yes, you do, my dear. <laughs> you you are, you are hearing me? Better. So, maybe I put uh, um, a, a question and ask you for a quick answer to open to the floor because we don't, uh, do not have uh, much time. So, one minute to each one of you. And, um, what, in your opinion, should be our value proposition from a center of excellence and how should it be measured? I'm not sure I got your first words. Could you repeat? Uh, how it should, uh, should be the value, uh, the, the value proposition of a center of excellence and how it should it be measured? Well, I mean, this is really, it's not really a question for us. A center of excellence should come from a bottom-up approach that you need it, that the stakeholders need it. They have to define their mission, yes. their objective, and th the way they keep performance indicators to measure it. Um, the, the, if they deliver, they should deliver according to what, uh, to, to the need for a center of excellence. Now, there are, of course, basic things like sustainability. A center of excellence should be sustainable. It's just, it's not one shot we fund and then it, it stops. And I think one of the uh, previous speakers was making that very clear. And this is very clear for us. Uh, okay, research is working by try and fail and sometimes success, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but here in that case should be sustainable. Um, Another point is really the impact. It should be sustainable, which is one impact, because there is a need which is satisfied, but it should also have a clear impact on the reality. With these two criteria, uh, I think we, you, you are largely done, and the rest is your, your own design. Uh, maybe one point, uh, core also to our heart, apart from uh, cooperation, this is the idea that not everything fits all. And a center of excellence should be uh, international, intra-European, should ensure consistency, but also cohesion. Uh, having uh, the capacity to develop specific approaches for specific domains, specific uh, needs, which could be different between the size of enterprises or the type of cooperation or the domain, or the steps in the value chain also. So with that, I stick, I hope I stick to the shortest time allowed. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. So, Vincent. Yes, <laughs> very quickly. I think I, I fully agree with Ellen. I think the, the value proposition is the, in terms of impact, what this uh, center of excellence could deliver and how this, to what extent this center of excellence could provide an added value 
compared to all the tools that we have at our disposal to foster collaboration and the exchange of knowledge in Europe. And the, uh, we've got the joint programs, we've got the, the missions now in Horizon Europe, we've got the uh, European technology and innovation platforms, uh, we've got the set plan. And the set plan, the strategic energy technology plan, it's been there since 2007. It's proven to uh, deliver uh, impacts. Um, it's proven to be uh, an agile tool at, uh, which could, can adapt to new policy developments. I mean, uh, just giving you an example, for instance, we had last year the offshore renewable energy strategy adopted by the Commission, which set clear targets for the development of offshore e renewables. And one of the conclusions of that strategy is that we should have more research and innovation in high voltage direct current. What we did in set plan is that we created a new implementation working group working precisely on that. And that, that, that we have to use that tool to its full extent. And so we have to demonstrate how a European center of excellence or centers of excellence would build on these existing tools and provide added value. I think it, in, in short for my answer, but I, I could provide some other examples, but I think we have to see how it fits in the, uh, in the panorama of, of existing tools. Thanks. Thank you. It's your turn. Ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I'm listening with with with, uh, with interest to your uh, your explanation, also from Ellen, um, and and it answers also well questions we have how to proceed, and uh, and of course the, the the aim is clear, and so the the turbines that are there today will certainly not be the turbines in 2050, and uh, and require a lot of innovations in order to. To, to be much better uh, and, and, let's say, fulfill the needs of the 2050 goals. So in that sense, um, I think that yeah, the goal, goal is clear. Uh, the way forward, I think we got some answers. And uh, more than that, I do not have to provide now. <laughs> so <laughs> we have here some questions. And questions are in line with this, how, how to deliver, how to... How to uh, have uh, uh, add value and uh, something that you you said uh, uh, say is that uh, from a group of researchers you identified the HVDC as a need for Europe so this could be a kind of result from from uh, from the, these uh, centers of excellence so uh, but the questions are in line with with this i will not really so uh, please um yeah. you go on yeah okay I, I understand the 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 request for quantitative indicators and and concrete results at the same time i think there's a risk that this undervalues fundamental research but also system it might be all, also qualitative indicators but we have to have something that measures yeah, okay, then I would be probably more in the line with uh, Ms. Schrey. Yeah. Um, I, I think in, in our work, we can often show that one option is better than another option. And, and the options sometimes are about billions, like a North Sea power grid or uh, how to decarbonize the industry. But we cannot say this is going to save you so many tons of CO2 or so much money in 2030. Yeah. Because we don't know, it's, it's only a tool that helps the industry make decarbonization uh, decisions or a tool that, that, that helps integrate consumers' flexibility in the market. But we cannot forecast how this whole market system is going to function 10 or 20 years in the future. We can only make, uh, 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 show kind of pairwise comparisons. If you do this, then you have maybe um, less risk than if you do that or you have higher benefits. So, ask I very quickly, please, one minute for both. Sure. Uh, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm going back to this added value when, when talking about how you should design and measure impact on, uh, on these centers. I, I think it is very important that you have high level research and, and use the traditional research indicators, but I also think you need to measure those centers in, in its ability to create implementation and, and, uh, and new activities in industry and, and, and government. Uh, so I would say if you set up uh, innovation ecosystems around this, where you can combine this high level, high quality research with, with shorter term use cases or other innovation activities in an innovation e ecosystem, that's, that's for me the way to go in, in, in terms of being able to engage the stakeholders for a period of eight to 10 years and still deliver relevance in the transition that's going on today based on high level research.
Okay, Adele. Okay, maybe one one uh, remark uh, on on what has been uh, said. The Center of Excellence um, do not need to to be um, limited only to technologies. It could it could also um, cover aspects of the transition. Uh, we know that I mean we are in the energy union here, and we know that a lot of the challenges are common to. Um, a set of countries or all, all, or all the member states. Um, and as such, I mean, the Centre of Excellence will make a lot of sense to cover a number of disciplines which are common or, or subjects of the transition which are common to uh, to union. And, and for instance, um, the modelling platform that Asger was mentioning is, is a very good example of something that would be needed at European level. Um, there are other examples, of course. Um, what I think also is that the value of a center of excellence, not only is it to you know, uh, avoid duplication, get critical mass, um, get a platform for this triangle government uh, research and, and industry um, uh, to, to, to discuss. If it's created at European level, I think it creates also, a ver uh, as, uh, as uh, Lawrence has mentioned, it is a platform which guarantees some level of coherence and continuity and resilience over the future, which is mostly unknown. Uh, so it's a way of uh, establishing uh, uh, a sustainable collaboration between the different uh, member states, which I think in itself brings a lot of resilience uh, to the whole process. So thank you, Adele. And I need to wrap up uh, the takeout for me. Uh, besides uh, uh, our need to build uh, centers of excellence that are uh, in, uh, aligned with sustainability needs, um, in my opinion, we also need to identify uh, some KPIs that uh, uh, allow the centers of excellence be of good use to the society and also, and this is a question mark for us all to discuss at lunch, how to give the, the right indicators, the right direction, so that the finance, finance, the financial systems finance the adequate projects for our goals. So this is a million dollars question, so let us <laughs> go, go and have lunch for, uh, for discussion. Thank you, Ellen. Are you there? No. <laughs> oh, no, I'm still oh. there. I'm oh, yes. still there. <laughs> oh, okay. I think you have the lunch. We have you. <laughs> so I don't invite you to lunch, but I have, we have one question. Sorry. Sorry, just before we go to lunch. We need the micro. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry to, to just disturb you a little before lunch. I have a question, like uh, a little relating to what one of the speaker was uh, talking, and related to what you said also, is okay. We have uh, IWG from Set Plan. We have GPC from Era. What are the borders? And now the Center of Excellence, the borders between these three, let's say, groups, which allow us to or prevent us to not do overlapping of the activities. So you say also there's something about that. So, okay, I know it's a quite large like question, <laughs> let's say. Maybe we'll not end it now, but if you can just give an insight. Thank you. Do you want to, to answer, Ellen? Yeah. Maybe uh, the, fact, the, the question would be to Ellen and to Vincent. Yeah, um, I, would, I would just take the example of hydrogen where we faced indeed a, a drastic increase of structures and, and interests. That's a good point, but we need to ensure the uh, consistency of all what is done. So um, we have an internal coordination inside the Commission, of course, that, that goes without saying. But we have uh, pleaded very uh, clearly for having a proper consistency approach between the other parts of the triangle. So you have the uh, national, and regional, the EU, and the industry, so the, what we call a triangle. Uh, on the side of uh, the member states, we have indeed the ERA, uh, we have the set plan, we have even the ETIPS in the set plan, which are linking, linking with the industry. And in addition, we have alliance with the industry, uh, and IPCEI with member states and industry. It's even more complicated. 
what we do is we try to ensure and to boost, to support ourselves, the coordination between the various involvements of member states. We try to uh, harmonize or um, uh, propose harmonization of the various trias and to uh, allocate to each challenge or problem uh, a tool, because we should not mix the policy, political coordination, the strategy and the tools themselves. The, the, the co-fund is a tool. The set plan is a strategic approach and they use the Clean Energy Transition Co-Fund as a tool. The centers of excellence will be a tool for me, and we have to keep that as a tool and coordinate with the other tools. So in a nutshell, yes, we are working very hard on that. Co-creation does not mean a mess. Huh? It means that at the end, we have something which is agreed by everyone. I stop here, you wait for your lunch, uh, and maybe Vincent wants also to answer on that. Thank you. Just, one note, uh, just to finish on a positive note, I mean, the building on what Hélène was saying about the good coordination between these different tools, I would like to give the example of batteries, for instance, where we've got the Batteries Europe, which is the European Technology and Innovation Platform, linking with the Batteries Alliance, linked with the Batteries Partnership, and that leads to concrete results. We've got more than 400 uh, organizations involved in the development of batteries in Europe. We've got more than 100 billion of commitments in battery producing. And by 2025, we think Europe could become the second largest uh, producer of, of cells in, in the world after China. So I think that coordination is possible and we need to have it in, in all the different fields. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. And for the sake of time, we have, I have to pass the floor to Niels for the concluding remarks. Thank you to you all. And I think they deserve an applause. <laughs>
um, uh, directions of this energy transition, um, which feeds into our idea about this kind of centers of excellence. And <clears throat> um, uh, to, to take away any doubt, I mean, we are, we are going to define this kind of uh, European centers of excellence, and uh, we will do that um, with our joint programs, which is the, the jewel in the crown, so to speak, for ERA. Um, how can it add value and uh, the bottom-up approach? I think ERA is actually the bottom-up uh, approach. We had a, a question from the audience about how does it fit within the whole uh, landscape. I think it's basically addressing the uh, items which are on the lower tier uh, scale and uh, also uh, utilizing the possibilities we have to uh, connect member states and certain countries with the vehicles at the European uh, level. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the only one standing between you and, and the lunch now, so I think I need to stop here. But <clears throat> when it comes to the question about options, I think it's clear that we need to do all, you know. So it's kind of it a crash in, into my head when it says we need to analyze more on how we do this. Well, yes, but I mean, we need to do all this stuff if we're going to reduce by the numbers we see. So the, the risk is really that we, 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 are, we are missing in action on this. So the pace is really important. I, I said this morning, uh, stating, you know, if you go through an unusually hot place, uh, just keep walking. I would say it's now start running, actually. Um, so with that, I'm just saying, um, stating and saying that uh, thank you very much for uh, all your interventions uh, from the speakers and panelists and the audience for listening in and for the participation. And uh, now there is the lunch, sir, so thank you all. <laughs>